one has signed up for public comment. So, uh, oh, I yeah, I called it forward, but I forgot to do roll call. All of our um, trustees are here, and we need to do the Pledge of Allegiance. <laughs> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Now, um, yeah, um, the section where we have comments on the previous month's public comment. Oh, we um, moved that uh, based upon, and Harrison, what we decided to do was put that, allow that people to talk about that if they wanted to put it on the special, the agenda, discussion of future agenda request. So when we get there, if there are things you'd like to talk about, put on that request, we can do that. Okay. All right. So the next item on the agenda is. What's this? <laughs> Some high-tech dance music. <laughs> you know? I turned me off. That might have been you. <laughs> yep. Are you giving a static already? Yeah. <laughs> Can you hear me well enough this way? I don't know. See. Easy to find us. I all right, and I will do this. Thank you, Regina. We'll share. Um, so it, uh, the next item on the agenda is Brenda Ludwig. <laughs> <laughs> and um, Brenda, we'll go, uh, just to remind you, we will go around and introduce ourselves. Okay. All right. Vanessa? I'm Vanessa Robinson. Nice to meet you. Katie Blank. Regina McCree. Rochelle Otteson. Judy Meyer from the Hayden Lake area. Thank you. I'm Brenda, by the way. <laughs> All right. So are you guys ready? We're ready. All right. So Pinehurst Library 2022. Um, well. See. If I know how to use this. I'm using a different presentation software than I usually use. <laughs> All right. So. A little history about the Pinehurst Library. So in 1974, members of the Kingston Pinehurst PTA talked about creating a library in the school ran by the PTA. But they decided, no, nah, it sounds like a lot of work. But some concerned citizens, the idea had potential. So those concerned citizens mapped out borders, went to show Show County Board of Commissioners, held public hearings, and created the Pinehurst Kingston Free Library District. So that lovely map is our incredibly complex borders um, that to no end, I actually went and looked at the drainage that some of them are referencing and they are dry creek beds um, that are not marked. <laughs> so some of the, the um, creeks up the river have actual signs on them. Cougar Creek is the one that is referenced by our <laughs> by our, uh, our layout, and it is not. Um, got a sign, it's um, on a Forest Service map, if you look at the right one, but that's the only way you're gonna find it. Um, so in 1976, uh, Pinehurst Kingston Library opened its doors um, inside the elementary school in the cafeteria. So one of the rules that they said is we had to have a door to the outside to allow public in. Um, that was separate from the school doors. So that was the concession that the school made. So if you ever drive over there and you happen to be looking at the front of the building, if you're looking at the front entry, word, entry doors, the large room to the side on the right-hand side is where the library used to be, was the former cafeteria. There is a door, that's our door. The library? Uh, it does not say library any longer. I think it did back in the day. All right, so here we go, that works. So in 1977, Pinehurst Kingston Free Library District contracted with Kootenai County Library District to provide services to residents in Rose Lake, Canyon, and Cataldo 
for three dollars and seven cents per person. So you guys paid us. It's great. Um, three dollars and seven cents per person, which seems like a very small amount right now. Is it per year? That was per year, yeah. In 1985, we joined CIN and we stopped charging y'all for um, service to the residents in Rose Lake, Canyon, and Catalo. And in 1996, specifically October 1st, Pioneer's Kingston Free Library District consolidated with Kootenai County Libraries, forming the Kootenai Shoshone Area Libraries, which eventually got rebranded as the Community Library Network. Like we've been through a lot of names. <laughs> All right. So one of you guys last year asked me um, what our service area, the population of our service area. And so you've seen the map. The borders are crazy. We have several small unincorporated communities in there that they don't have the um, population listed for. But I will tell you, the population of Pinehurst is 1,655. And we currently have 200 or 2,003 cardholders. So, <laughs> you know. <laughs> We're doing all right. Now that the history is over, um, our team, there's me, the manager, Anne is my right-hand woman. She is the organizer that she's the one who keeps us in line, does everything for us. Uh, Kim is one of our adult programmers slash circulation specialists. She's, I like to refer to her as our polish because she keeps us nice and clean and tidy. And she actually just went through and organized some of our cupboards and put um, labels on all of them, and we're looking styling. Um, so Jessica is in the bottom corner. She's one of our adult programmers slash circulation specialists, and she is what I like to refer to as creative chaos. She is your idea girl. Um, Jamie is in the middle on the bottom. She is our youth services person. She's our kid wrangler. <laughs> and then we have JR in the bottom right-hand corner, and that is our new hire. He joined us uh, a couple months ago. And so with programs, we have Jamie Riley. She's only been here since January. It feels like she's been doing this forever. And oh, she's keeping us so organized. She's been keeping the library staff informed of all the programs that are coming so we can help advertise for her. It has been amazing. She did comment that she has been asked to help train some of the newer YS staff. And she's like, I don't know that I've been here long enough to do that. <laughs> But she's actually really good. She knows her stuff. And then for the adult programs, we have Jessica and Kim. And so we're trying new things. We've been doing a lot of the district-wide programs and taking advantage of those. Uh, we've been collaborating with the YS staff to have family programming. Um, they've been looking for presenters out in the community so that we can have people who have knowledge of specific areas come in and do really great presentations for us. And then we're also trying to find the right mix of some of those low effort um, high turnout programs. Mm -hmm. So like programs like Bunko, where you're going to need 12 people, but all you have to do is set up is grab some dice mm -hmm. and some snacks. Um, we're also trying to balance that with the educational but time consuming programs where the programmers are actually having to learn how to do something before they present it like a craft program. And so We've changed our space a little bit again. Uh, so some things that we would like you to take notice of as you're walking around the library, as you guys usually do, um, we have a new self-checkout desk, which matches our great big old circ desk that we're so proud of. And we have a new sit-down circulation desk that's sitting right next to our old circulation desk, but they match so they look like they actually belong together. Um, our ladder display moved to make way for a video spinner that we got from Raft Room, and it's I think our members are actually quite pleased with it. Um, we have new bark in our landscaping, thanks to Randy and the facilities team. And then we got a new spinner in the entryway to display our upcoming programs, and it looks so neat and tidy, and we're so proud of it. And then, any questions? Will you be? You will be available to help take us on a tour and point these things out. Absolutely. Okay, that sounds good. We're going to be doing that about halfway through. Okay. We'll All right. Have you. But anybody else? Comments? Questions?
What was that? The cabinets. Oh, <laughs> I did forget to point out the cabinets. We did get new cabinets too, mm -hmm. which uh, they were installed the same time that the desk and the um, self-check station came. Uh, it was by the Idaho Department of Corrections and they installed it in just a couple of hours. It was the most amazing thing I've ever seen. Oh, um, wow. So we've designated who has what cupboard. So the first cupboard is cleaning. The second cupboard is adult programming in Jessica. The third cover, set of cupboards is, well, it's mine for drink service stuff for all the library programs. Kim has her, she can see the little labels peeking out <laughs> underneath. Um, this is the second one from the wall. And then Jamie has that last one next to the wall. So everybody's kind of got their space and they're kind of all excited about it. Not all of us have moved in yet, but some of us have. <laughs> So um, I was oh, said the name of the woman who's the, is it Kim Riley is for the youth services. Uh, Jamie Riley. Jamie Riley. Yeah. Um, and I was just I, I was thinking about that again how that how you know you get youth services people from but it's really neat to incorporate mm -hmm. them into your life and then to be able to do youth services. I mean it sounds like you were able you've been able to expand it a little. Is that uh, yes. Jamie is growing the programs like. Uh, she was a little nervous um, starting out through summer, so she kind of took it easy. And I have been helping her publicize her fall programs. There's a lot. It's, it's kind of impressive. And, and are members responding yeah. to more of that? Yes, yeah. they are. Um, we have a lot of people who are really excited to hear that our fall um, story time series has started up starting tomorrow. Um, so we've got a lot of feedback about that. We have our homeschoolers have already been in contact being like, when are you doing homeschooling programming now? So uh, we're looking forward to starting up for our fall series and, and see where it goes. That, that's the, I mean, I just love it that as a district, we can do more in Pinehurst. You know, that's yeah. really cool. That's really yeah, cool. we actually outshine all of our competitors or competitors <laughs> by quite a bit. Your competitors, your silver, your uh, the yes, Shoshone so. County Libraries, yeah, they don't have quite the budget because they're all individual city libraries. So, yeah, not quite the means lord it over them. <laughs> <laughs> that would be inappropriate. <laughs> I, I do have one question. What, um, because I don't know Pinehurst very well. Okay. Um, what is the, um, the adult children population? Here is there a lot of children here? Is there a grade school, two grade schools? There is one grade school uh, that is just right next door. Mm -hmm. uh, that grade school serves. Um, well, actually, there's two two grade schools in Calhoun School District. One is Canyon Elementary, um, that's serviced by the Bookmobile. Uh, this one is servicing all of Kellogg. Um, like halfway between Kellogg and Osborne is where the uh, district line is, and it serves all the ones this way. So Fort Coopy County. So, uh, but Pinehurst itself, we are more of a retirement community, but we do have uh, young families also. Okay, thank you. Question then, for, for folks that live outside the district, across mm -hmm. the border, uh, is there a charge for them to use our system? So for the kids who have cards through the school, we give them a courtesy card. It doesn't allow them to have, um, like some of our online resources, but it does allow them to check out one per, one book per visit. Uh, we only allow them to have one item on their card, age appropriate. Um, the other cards are you know, like if they're if they're in, obviously they're in. But uh, we only serve the elementary school kids that way. So once they graduate and go off to Kellogg Middle School, we assume that Kellogg will handle them. Um, usually, they do upon request. So the kids there in and Kellogg school system. So they start out here in Pinehurst right. through uh, grade five. Yep. So when they graduate um, from elementary school and go to middle school, which is over <laughs> in Kellogg, um, then the Kellogg library will give them courtesy cards upon request if they're out of the service area. If they're in the service area. If yeah. they're in the service area, they're entitled to a card. <laughs> Is there a fee to get the out of service area card? If you wanted a full fledged card, it would be a $25 per household fee. Per year? Per year. Any reciprocation we could do someday with the other district? Um, like, what do you mean? Uh, some way to cut the cost for people to use a library? 
So Kellogg would have to maybe pay us so that we could do that. I don't know. I'm just thinking out loud about. Yeah, yeah. so the issue is the kids generally in Smelterville and then up the gulches, which are outside the service area. And so there's not really a could be like Chisholm County that would represent them or the school district. And there hasn't been any talk of that, but it would be an interesting conversation to have. So really the conversation happens with the school districts more than just follow all of moms and dads who are in the school system. Mm -hmm. Then that family fee of $25 covers the it. whole household plus yeah, any of the kids that they have. Yeah, and since we're on this vein, mm -hmm. um, so if they're out of that the district and they have to pay that, that's basically because their taxes aren't coming in here. That is correct. So it's it's not a you know it's a big it's not a big fee for them. They're just actually not paying into it. But and I think you're right. That's what I was trying out was uh, should should they is there some way to have them remunerate us so that we can take care of them? But if they have a library somewhere else, then then that's also meets the need. Mm -hmm. you know, particularly for children, we'd like to be sure that they can get to use the library somewhere somehow at some time. Yeah. For families to drive them there is a challenge, especially if you're up the hour away. So, just thinking out loud too about um, have they been has anybody been invited to help pay so that you know, folks could use this library? I don't know if we want to do that. <laughs> so, just just always thinking about access to folks to the library, paying their fair share, whatever that is. Um, when I I moved here to. The Coeur area in 1972 <laughs> and um, lived outside of the city of Coeur and had to purchase a library card and it was $25 then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I thought it was cheap. I thought it was a bargain, you know, so. It is for some folks and others it's, it's a barrier. It's just, I remember that too, Katie. That, uh, did, did the Coeur Lane city folks pay a fee to come to our Hayden library? Because now we were a system. They I don't know. know. So one of the tricks we use to help our lower income families get around the fee, well, maybe not around the fee, is some of our cousin libraries out in the Silver Valley do mm -hmm. offer payment plans so they can pay for as little as $2 per month. So, uh, and sometimes that's more affordable for those mm -hmm. people who $25 in sure. a lump sum is just too much. Mm -hmm. So we do try to help them out. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Anyone else? Anything they'd like to ask her? All right. Well, Brenda, thank you so much. It's good to see you again. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> and we will see you again in a little while and for a tour. All righty. Live. I live in Wallace. Oh, okay. so way up the ways away. <laughs> About 20 minute commute. <laughs> so do you live in the district? I do not. Mm -hmm. I live actually up the Burke Canyon. I'm about a quarter of a mile from being in a library district. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thanks again. Thank you. All right. The next item on the agenda is the consent agenda. Um, and I would either entertain a motion or somebody can start discussion on that. I have a couple of proposed changes. They're they're so minor that you know sometimes I wonder if it's if I, if I need to bring it up. But on the let's see the meeting of August 11th, the special meeting. Um, Did the budget hearing me? Yes. Okay. Sorry. Mm -hmm. the discussion of 2023 budget. There's a one bullet point about. Four or five sentences in the sentence that starts, she believes it would be short sighted. That's what. Um, eight lines down, just short sighted is misspelled, isn't it? Isn't it be S I G H T E D? Oh, yeah. Okay. okay. <laughs> and then, and then um, jump down to about eight lines up from the bottom, a sentence that starts Rhoda noted that salaries, there's, I think it should read, Rhoda noted that salaries listed are current wages. There's an extra burn, take out the R. Because right now it reads, Rhoda noted that salaries are listed are current. 
or maybe maybe and Amy, I, maybe you tell whichever salaries you listed. Yeah. <laughs> yes, yeah, salaries listed are current wages. So yeah, we just had an extra. I don't have any other changes on that set of minutes. So if, if anyone else noted anything, maybe we should call it. Mm -hmm. um, on the regular meeting of August 18. Um, on page on page two, in regards to the emerging technologies report, the second to last sentence of that report um, is something that I said. McCree noted while she was skeptical of starting the department, she is very pleased with this development. I would just take it out that and. <laughs> On page four, in regards to our budget discussion, at the bottom of the page, second bullet point about towards the middle, just past the middle of that section, um, Rhoda noted, by reducing collections will cause an increase. I think it would read better if it said Rhoda noted Reducing collections would cause an increase in staff needs. I assume that's consistent with the substance of, of what. Which way do that page? Four. Let's go to the top rule four. I had circled. Uh, Allison said that intellectual freedom is for forcing. I, I guess circled out. I just want to be sure. That Maybe you should push out that. Read okay, you. Um, yeah, it doesn't really make sense. Where is that one? Uh, goal four at the top of the page. Oh, bullet point. Audison mm -hmm. said that intellectual freedom. Mm -hmm. four. Uh, probably just take out. I tried to take out the four, and I wasn't sure that was right. And take out is four and change it to first. First things. So what's the correction that would make sense for you? Take out is and for and change yeah. forcing into forces. As I said, that intellectual freedom for the crown for material as well. Okay. Sorry, go ahead. Okay, and on that same page, uh -huh. four. Um, about halfway down the page, you know, where it says M, comma, C, McCray slash Audison. My name should not be part of that because I didn't make that motion. Yeah, but you made the amendment. You yeah, made the yeah, amendment. The amendment was earlier, so um, that was already a done deal. But it's passing with the amendment. Yeah. Okay. So. I'll move, I'll move that we accept the consent agenda with the changes noted. Um, actually, there was one oh, change. Sorry. Sorry. Mm -hmm. On page five, very top. Audison does not think now is not the time to increase the budget. Let's stick out mm -hmm. for that second not. So mm -hmm. we leave not in between is and the. So should we? Audison does not think now is uh, time. <laughs> yeah. Double negative. Yeah. <laughs> and so I don't think I need to restate my motion. Okay. It, incorporate that change. Yeah. It's been moved. <laughs> it's been moved to accept the consent agenda with changes noted. Is there any more discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 All righty. And kudos to the note taker. He's got the lowest. Thank yeah. you. So. All right. The next item on the agenda is the Community Library Network um, our 2022 financial statement. And we can either, um, I would either entertain a motion or um, to um, set that, uh, either entertain a motion or just go ahead and start discussion. We're on the blue. We're on green. Oops. 
Yeah, you know, CIN, CIN, right. CIN, the blue is CIN's financial right. statements, which were just accepted in the consent agenda. The question is um, that I guess it's just on uh, the first page was the one Oh, yeah. Oh. Thank you. I wasn't seeing yeah. that. Did you? you um, that's we, part of the consent agenda. Oh, I always forget to. Okay. Yep. I stepped away unless you had a question. You can always do that. Uh, I just was wondering on the blue mm -hmm. on my. This is the, what this is is the C I N finance. Okay, so I'm not allowed to ask. No, no, answer. no. I just wanted to clarify it for the okay the okay. minutes and stuff. Like that. <laughs> All right, so line 29, EBSCO discovery. Um, I'm trying to figure out what EBSCO is. Um, so it says that we've spent zero of that. I'm wondering where, where that money is going instead. It's the probably just redemption. It just renewed, so that will come out of this funds. What is it? Um, um, Open Athens novelist. Yeah, so it, it works with our novelist database and it integrates with our catalog so that when you are search anyway, there's there's links through. So novelist is a reader's advisory tool where you can go in and get book selections, book recommendations, um, but it allows the catalog and novelist to speak to each other. So if you're a novelist, it can show you that we actually own those titles. OK, so it's a program. It's a program. Yes, uh, but yeah, as a subscription service. Okay. Now back to the financial report. And I move that we accept the community library network income statement, financial statement. Right there, right there. <laughs> financial statement. Oh, I'm statement. looking at this one. Financial statement dated August. 2020, 2022. Okay, it's been moved to accept the community library network financial statement for August 2022. Discussion, question, concern. Yeah, so lines 28, 32, and 33. Um, let's see. Box selections. 28. What what were they? Uh, 28, 32, and 33. It's approximately 90,000 that's unaccounted for. Is that unaccounted for? Or unspent. Unaccounted. So does that just is that something that we vote to put into cart at the end of the year? Is that where that goes? Or yes. So we will at the end of the year, if we have both unspent money and extra income, that's when we'll do an amended budget um, and the board will approve where that unspent money will go. So it doesn't go without our approval. Correct. Oh. Try it again. Okay. <laughs> uh, so I'm just going to ask. Um, okay. So do we do an amended budget every year? Is that normal? Um, we have done it the last two to three years. Um, I, I haven't gone further back, so I'd have to, to lean on. But but typically, um, yes, because sometimes there is just extra revenue, whether it's extra revenue through donations and a large bequest, or whether it was an extra grant we didn't receive, or sales tax that was un um, that we over or underestimated. We and for those of us who've been here a little bit longer. We before COVID, we didn't do amended budgets very much, but it has been all over the map since since COVID. Well, on this particular line, telecom, this is an area that that Bob, I believe, would often talk to us about because we don't. That's the one where we get E-rate approval, or um, so we went into the fiscal year when we passed the budget, not knowing if we would. So the Bulk, the, the bulk of that is because we received E rate reimbursement. Is that right, Janelle? <laughs> um, we did amend the budget before approving it um, for the fiscal year because we, you, for this for the current fiscal year, we were able to amend it to um, accept the E rate discount. 
what those lines don't represent is the potential reimbursement we get from the state because we never know if we're going to get money from the state. When do we know? When they send us an application and they approve it. So we we did get it approved. Um, it comes uh, semi-annually and they did approve it. And this year we were approved to receive um, reimbursement for the Like the, the hot spots that uh, we check out to members outside of the hot spots that are attached to the Chromebooks. So we got an additional um, reimbursement that we have not in the past. And so those reimbursements came after the budget was passed. And so, so yeah, the money in there was, we weren't sure whether we would get the state reimbursement. Questions? I have one more. I just wanted to give everyone else an opportunity. Um, all right, so line 49, repairs and maintenance for Spirit Lake. Um, I saw somewhere in there that they had redone their parking lot. So I'm guessing that's where the uh, 19,000 came from. Um, so what, was that a CARF expenditure? Because over to the right, it says that they're at 206.81% of their budget and that it would be part of their budget, right? Um, no, because it's the parking lot, we can't. That cannot come from car. So, um, so this was one that yes, it overextended the um, the Spirit Lake repair and maintenance line, but there was um, we had a project for Harrison, and so a few months ago, I said we were putting the project at Harrison on hold to do the Spirit Lake um, parking lot, and so this is where the repairs and maintenance as a whole are going to balance out, but individually, Spirit Lake is going to be way over, and then you'll see um, Apple and Post Falls are going to be way under. So this is, yeah, a case where we felt like that was a higher priority than um, some of the projects that were earmarked in. Yeah, there are no That doesn't mean that it's fallen off of this. It means it's going to a different place on the list. It, right. It means we may not get to, so the Spirit Lake we did do, but that was not one that was in in the budget for this year. Um, but because we did it, then we put some other projects that were budgeted mm -hmm. on hold. Um, and those may come up if we have um additional carry forward at the end of the year. So we would come back with those projects and say, a, we didn't get to those. Um, can are we able to do that out of the additional carry? Some of those are weather related. The parking lot needed to be done now because you can't do it in June, November, December. Correct. So there's a little bit of juggling that goes on there too. Thank you. Okay. And any other questions or concerns? No. Okay. Then it's been moved to accept the financial statement. Community Library Network financial statement for August 2022. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? All right. Thank you. And then the next item on the agenda is um, circulation statistics, and they were a table, table, a table thing. <laughs> <laughs> what is that called? Table, table packet. Thank you. Yeah. Table packet. Part of your table packet. Yes. So the circulation statistics were um, were on your table. Um, just a few notes. Um, typically, June and July are the really busy summer months, and then August is kind of a taper month. But actually, August for many of our locations was actually much busier than than July. So, so yeah, August was just really busy, and um, lot, both um, circulation wise and visit wise, so we had a good month. And to what do you attribute that? I'm not sure. I don't know if it was good weather. You know, people were not traveling as much. Maybe they did their travel earlier. So we had people around and we also had some great and um, we had um, some project neighborly events. So both that was bringing people in the doors for both the event, but then, um, you know, they could come and enjoy the library as well. So that would count, you know, both um, that they visited the library and then, and then programming. And we had just some some great August programs, too. And does project neighborly require you as part of the funding to give account back as how mm -hmm. I did? That's not remember Any any anything else? Any other questions or comments concerning circulation? 
I'm like, kudos to us for, <laughs> for circulation going up um, when it's even when it's not supposed to. <laughs> All right. The director's report. So I'm um, not necessarily going to go over things that were already um, in the report unless anyone um, has any questions. One thing I did want to mention um, that I did not write up in the report because it was going to be kind of a little bit better to explain in person. We had an email a few weeks ago. This has to do with um, delinquent property taxes. So right now, Kootenai County um, collects um, property taxes for all the taxing entities and then they disperse them. And so we received notice um, on the beginning of August that Kootenai County, or actually at the end of July, is that Kootenai County was starting October 1, would be keeping all penalties and interest associated with delinquent property taxes. Um, typically in the past, they had been sending the um, penalty and interest to whatever taxing entity the property tax went with. Um, so we received that notice, and then in response to that, several taxing entities have not been very happy <laughs> about that. Um, so there was, um, I think, City of Coeur d'Alene had responded back. Um, the City of Post Falls actually started a letter um, and had several taxing entities sign it. We received notice just a few days before the deadline to sign it, and I felt like since we didn't have a board meeting, I didn't necessarily want to put our name attached to it without um, talking with, um, with the board. But they've approached the county and are saying, you know, hey, this does affect our budgets. Um, some entities, it's a lot for us. This year was $24,000. So if that goes forward, that would be $24,000. You know, if we have that same issue in the future, um, that would be money that is going to the county inst instead of us. So this is an issue that has not been resolved. I mean, well, the county is still saying actually that they're going forward with this change, but there are several taxing entities that are saying um, they're not comfortable with this change. And they've quoted, several statutes have been quoted back and forth. So I will email all, I didn't have time to, um, to copy all of the documentation, but I will send it all to you um, because there's, this isn't anything that's specifically stated in Idaho code that they can, but there are codes that talk about, um, what do I call it, idle monies? It's kind of a, an interesting term there. So I think the county feels like they have a solid case and then the taxing entities also feel like they have a solid case. So if you have heard anything about that, just wanted to kind of share where, where we're at with that. So. You're saying that our district would lose $24,000 mm -hmm. starting October 1. October 1. I mean, you know, each year we never know how many, how much delinquent property tax will get, right? That if they didn't pay in the current year, we never know when they're going to pay it. Um, but this last year, that's the amount. So, so they're keeping the delinquent taxes or just the penalties and interest? Penalties and interest. Penalties and interest. So, and the estimate, if they kept that from us is 24, we'd lose $24,000? If it had been effective during this current fiscal year, it would have been $24,000 $24,000 in penalties and interest only. They don't keep the taxes. They just keep the penalties and interest. Correct. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's what they're proposing. I mean, they haven't done it yet. But For a out. small district like us, $24,000, I can't imagine what that would be, the hit that cities and stuff would need. Mm -hmm. Or the change, I should say, change. That would be for Madam Chair, is there anything more we should do with this in anticipation of? I know folks, some agencies have fussed over it, and some have sent out a letter saying no, no. Um, and something comes along before the next board meeting. What role do we as a board want to have in looking at this? I mean, I think that would, I mean, we didn't necessarily put this as an action item because it isn't necessarily, there's no specific action that we can I mean if we wrote a letter I mean it would be more just saying Amy go ahead and write a letter you know what I mean mm -hmm. it isn't um, if you're all comfortable I don't need to do that and I'm not necessarily even asking to do that um, the next action would be that the board of commissioners is um, having their budget hearing on mm -hmm. August 31st at 6 p.m. and so there are some taxing entities that will be there to either provide August 31st? Yeah, public August 31st. comment Did it already happen oh Yes, you're right. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, this I was reading um, backwards. So yes, that actually they already delivered the letter at the August 31st um, budget hearing. Um, nothing. 
I mean, I mean I, the, the letter was delivered. A few entities made public comment. Okay. Sorry, I thought that was the preliminary. Um, mm -hmm. So the county commit, you're talking about the county commissioners. Yes. And are they, they want to keep that money or they're, they're uh, saying give it to the taxing district? No. <laughs> the, the, the county commissioners has, based, so it was the county treasurer um, who proposed this change um, right. as of October 1 that they would keep the, the so forth. So the county commissioners um, have just let that stand, so to speak. But I think that's where pe the taxing entities are appealing to. And, and appealing is, I'm not using this as a formal appeal. I'm, I'm saying that's where people are, are thinking action could be taken as if the county commissioner said no. Um, then, so at this point, it would just be, you know, at future county commissioner meetings, but nothing was, um, they basically delivered it on August 31st, but um, no response was given from the county. Mm -hmm. I mean, when you say there have been, you know, you've been copied on the emails that have been exchanged on this topic, is that, and so presumably, do those emails contain the letter that some of the taxing yes. entities signed and the and the code provisions that people are mm -hmm. signing? Okay. Yes. Um, yes. So so I will I will forward all of that. Basically, they use the mailing list that the county uses for tax disbursements, which I think um, for our library district, it's myself, Janelle, and, uh, Michelle as as treasurer. So so um, and then all the other entities that receive. So, so I know you don't know, mm -hmm. but I mean, based on having read those emails mm -hmm. and the positions being taken, I mean, do you think the treasurer's position is supportable? I mean, what you know, if you had to, if you, if you had to, you know, be a gambling person, what are the odds that the taxing districts are going to get though. this changed position? I, I mean, the county does feel like they have a strong position. However, it's not something that any other county in Idaho has ever done. Mm -hmm. So, so they are kind of making a unique case under the statute that they've cited. Um, so I, I think where the taxing districts have an issue is, um, you know, this is a big change. And for some districts, it's it's a few thousand. And for some districts, it's, you know, 90 to 100,000. You know, so, so that's a significant amount of money. And I think the county is saying, well, this helps pay for the work we have to do, which there is a role that the county plays in um, collecting and collecting mm -hmm. and so forth. But, you know, if you add all of that up, that seems like a lot of money, you know? So, um, so, so I, I think, I think people felt like there one should have been more communication versus just kind of a letter saying <laughs> we're doing this and it's effective October one um, versus kind of um, some back and forth and a little bit more advanced notice because most people's budgets were already well on their way to being approved. Whereas if you knew ahead of time, let's say you were a larger entity that you know ninety thousand dollars is no longer going to come next year you might have made different adjustments in the budget. So that that would be more where I would lean is, you know, this this came pretty late in the budget cycle in terms of how it might affect us. I don't know that I necessarily, you know, but, you know, lost revenue is also lost revenue as well. You know, so, I mean, you know, if we did lose 20,000, that is 20,000 that <laughs> we were going to use. <laughs> we might need to make up elsewhere. So. Is it... Does the, did the county give a reason why they <laughs> felt that this was necessary? It cost them to do it, but one thing I saw. Um, so, so, you know, th this was kind of the, the very short original email. It says, taxing districts beginning October 2022, penalties and interest associated with delinquent property taxes will be retained by the county to cover in expenses incurred in collections. Should you have any questions, please contact me directly. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, it was, you know, it was very brief. Too. Lots of compassion. <laughs> brief and to the point. Um, <laughs> So, so yes, I mean, there, um, and that was on July 29th. So just in terms of well, the time. Um, I guess two months, but again, right. I mean, most, um, everyone had their budget hearings and some had already published, we had already published our budget at that point or had submitted our budget for publication. It's, it's interesting that no other county in this particular state does that. Yeah, so it's very interesting. Yeah, 
Um, yeah, yet. And I can't say that I'm not 100% against them keeping it either. I mean, I see their points. And it's, you know, if I mean, take it back to when the first library in the country got rid of their late fees. And they were the first one to do it. And now pretty much the whole country does it. I'm just saying in terms of a small start that spreads. So who knows, maybe other counties will end up doing this and states. Um, OK, anything else? Could I follow up on that? Yeah. Is there any point in asking them to delay that process for a year so that we know that that's going to happen? And I assume what they're setting up is for every year from now on, we won't be getting any revenue. And if they delayed it a year, we would know as we did next year's budget, not to count. Think about trying to find some compromise that says you have to see. And that's actually the letter that um, <laughs> the mayor of Post Falls wrote, you know, and then was asking people to to help sign. Basically, you know, as, was asking them to withdraw this this change and schedule a meeting with the ta taxing districts to have a discussion regarding the matter. So that was kind of the original ask, good, good. you know, that the city of Post Falls did. And then I think um, what I don't have is a copy of the actual letter that they had all of the taxing entities sign, but it was somewhat similar that it was requesting them to delay the change and, um, and have discussion on the matter. So this is, I mean, we're, meeting fairly late you know in terms of that um budget hearing had already taken place but i just wanted you all to be aware of what the discussion that was happening we haven't thrown our hat in the ring either way so to speak so we didn't sign the letter we didn't respond back but we have been watching it all very closely and, and we're free to ride whoever's coattails that we want <laughs> <That's right. laughs> thank you amy i think that's it's an important concept that i hadn't pushed it enough i've been watching it and thinking about it. Uh, because it does ripple right down to us. And I think we as a board just need to think through uh, what we want to direct our director to do, which so far we've watched and monitor. Uh, but I would suggest that we as a board authorize Amy to write a letter saying, um, we understand the concerns, uh, we just need more lead time, and we'd like to, uh, I don't know if I want to agree to having it implemented or just say it needs more review for fiscal impact. Well, how, how about, I mean, I don't, here's a, an alternative. I mean, have we consulted with our attorney <laughs> to look at the, the various positions and, and maybe our attorney could chime in? We have not. Um, we have, have had other questions that our attorney's been researching about <laughs> other matters. Um, so, so we did not, I mean, there were, um, I think some of the city attorneys joined in, um, so to speak, um, but we have not had our attorney look at this yet. But it's always a dilemma because it costs money to, to study something we may not get versus putting us some signal in there that, that we understand there's maybe a need. The same budgeting process we use, we need them to use, which is a courtesy of giving us some lead time on it. What, what about, you know, if if the request, I don't know what the general letter said, but the request for sitting down and allowing taxing entities to discuss it mm -hmm. with them, mm -hmm. that is a, you know, so that we can hear points of view, at least that, you know, what about having our director write a letter saying we support that discussion? I think that's a great idea for you to write a letter and not necessarily just sign somebody else's. I would just be signing it, you know, library director for community, you know, library. So I wouldn't necessarily be putting the board, uh, you know, I would just be saying, I mean, and because this is an, an action, I just want to say, is the majority of the board okay, you know, if we kind of chime in as well? And like I said, I'd be more inclined to do something like that, that we'd also like to be able to sit down and discuss um, and, you know, that, that the lead time was not very much. Yeah, know, everybody's point of view. Right. Mm -hmm. And you mean to write your own um, email or the yeah. other. Um, and then, so this has to be in before the October. <laughs> We're done. <laughs> it's just an addition. We're a postscript. It's already done. No, well, but it, the, the letter getting to them, I mean. It really, it would probably be by their next, um, so that it would be submitted. But and I'd have to look at, I think, the next county commission meeting is. We meet on the three, two weeks. So it's it supposed to go in effect in two weeks, yeah? 
It is, right. So it would just be getting it in by the next county commission meeting. And, and you know, again, we, um, because we hadn't met, I mean, this all kind of transpired between our last meeting and, and this meeting. I mean, we've gotten the original email, but some of the ripple effects of that email hadn't been known yet. So, um, so we can also just continue to watch, <laughs> you know, watch and gather. But we can, add, we can yeah. request of them at least, you know, we're in with the people who'd like to sit down and discuss this. Is that right? Is that an, uh, yeah, yeah. I don't know if we move that because it's an out action item. Just we well, it's not an action. It, it would be more just like, are you all okay with me writing a letter? And if there's the majority, mm -hmm. or I don't think we should just let it slide by. So we can put it on the agenda for next month. Mm -hmm. Let's update on how that discussion went. Okay. I think that's helpful. And that's everything I have. Unless there was any questions about anything else, I throw okay. them of course. Um, I do have a question. Okay. Uh, so the second to the last paragraph says the policy includes prior adoption of the Library Bill of Rights and the Freedom Treaty Statement. Um, so were those separately adopted, or just the in the uh, other the last materials policy? It says that we subscribe. Um, the last few draft. I mean, the last few iterations. Um. um yeah, so I'm not sure when the date was, but sometime past the material selection policy had a statement saying that the um, the library district adopts um, the freedom to read statement and the library of all rights. So that statement has been in the last several versions of the material selection policy. And I do remember some of the soul parents adopting that. Any other questions for Amy concerning the director's report? Are you any further along in finding the admin person? Um, we did hire an admin assistant. Um, basically, um, we finished up interviews um, a little over a week ago and um, just informed the individual a couple days ago. So I don't know that we have it. Start yesterday. Yesterday. Um, it actually is an internal person, a circulation specialist at Post Falls, um, who just started um, a few months ago, but she has lots of admin assistant background mm -hmm. and financial and bookkeeping and quite, I mean, she really has kind of all of the aspects that we were looking for. So we're just working closely. We don't want to short staff um, Post Falls circulation, um, but we hope that she'll be able to start in the next few weeks. So um, how many hours is the uh, admin assistant? Um, it's 28 hours a week. So does this person go full time because they're going to be circulation too? No, no. Oh. So that they would be vacating their circulation oh, okay. specialist okay. position and then moving into to this one. So they had been in a 19 hour a week um, position at Post Falls and then mm -hmm. so this will be um, more hours for them and Percy. Okay, great. That sounds going. good. That's nice to be able to hire people internally. Mm -hmm. um, okay, anything else? Alrighty. And the next item on the agenda is our tour. And I am, yeah, no, that's good. That'll bring us kind of, you know, tour and break. So yeah. That'll be just perfect. Um, and we are going to have 40 minutes for this discussion. You want me to sign that? Yeah, okay. that'll keep us kind of on track. That. So, in starting that, Amy, would you like to start and give us a background on this? And sure. So, I'll just kind of walk through some of the suggested, so some of the changes that we are suggesting. Um, so, the first one is under responsibility. Um, so the wording in the prior um, didn't quite match how Idaho code spells out responsibilities between um, board and director. So we did change the wording there um, to say that um, essentially the board approves the policy for the acquisition of materials, but um, the responsibility for the acquisition of materials is um, with the library director. And then we just so since we were already kind of rewording that, um, then we added some um, statements there talking about um, 
that patrons can recommend materials for consideration. We did not have that in the prior policy. And since that is something that we do, um, that we wanted to make sure to, to add that. So that was um, the cha main changes there in the responsibility section. And I'll just kind of walk through the changes and then I can take it from there for in terms of discussion. And then um, we did just add a statement um, based on um, the freedom to read along with the freedom to hear and to view is protected by the First Amendment to the Constitution of the United States. So that kind of statement now then leading into um, the statement about the library, um, the district subscribing to the freedom to read and the Library Bill of Rights. And then um, under selection criteria, um, we didn't necessarily um, change any of the, the selection criteria that, that we use in terms of um, whether we select material or not. But we did add a couple of statements that I felt like um, um, could are important. Um, so we did talk about that we would not be adding anything that are any um, items that are unprotected by the First Amendment. And then we did add um, mm -hmm. um, from the Idaho Code um, that materials for minors that violate that would be excluded from the juvenile and young adult collections. And then under withdrawal of materials, we just kind of reworded um, the way it says duplicate copies. There's lots of reasons for why we'd have many copies in the co collection. So we're not just going to weed something because there's more than one. But because it, it's more than that, it's basically um, do we have demand for it? And if it's in a more obscure title, then we might only have one copy. If it's popular, we might have several. So we just reworded that to make it clear that it's more copies in excess of demand. And then um, the very last part, I did um, add some different wording here for the reconsideration. I'm having recently gone through this process. Um, it, one, it kind of spells out a little bit more what we did, because um, before, um, basically we had a vague statement about the review process. So I did want to make it um, a little bit clearer and include, some of this is including procedural items, um, you know, in terms of talking about the review team and, and so forth. But I felt like this made sense to kind of integrate that um, part there. Um, I did add, um, Prior, um, you see that the um, additional statement just said if additional action is warranted, the citizens request for reconsideration will be submitted to the board for final action. And I felt like um, this really is an appeal process. And so I want, felt like that should be spelled out a bit more, but also that, um, you know, I wanted it to be clear too that the patron can ask for that, but also give a time frame because it may not make sense if a decision had been given to them you know, eight months ago, and then they ask, you know, for it to go to the board, that really it should be kind of a timely process. And then um, I did add, um, I felt like it was important to add statements that we do belong to a consortium mm -hmm. and that we can only reconsider items that were purchased, you know, under our policy within our budget. So if there's something that another mm -hmm. consortium member holds and that it was purchased by them, then you would need to be a resident of that individual library and um, submit a reconsideration there. Um, and then the last thing, and, and this is more because um, we do want to provide a pathway for reconsideration and we do want this process to um, to be transparent, but we also know that it is a time consuming process. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, if we reviewed an item once, I'm not sure, you know, six months from now we should um, review that same item. And so I did add an item um, and looked at several other libraries policies. And so this seemed to be a um, the three year period um, seemed to be um, something that that many libraries. Follow. And those were the changes that we are suggesting. OK, um, today's today we don't have an action item down. We don't have this as an action item. So what we are is just in discussion about this and we can we can do the discussion however we want, however it turns out, or we can just go around the room as we do. Um, I don't know what you would like, um, but I will. I do have our check sheet so that we can, you know, speak once and then move on and let somebody else speak. And then when everybody's had a first turn, then we'll move on to everybody getting a second turn. I think maybe going um, by each headline mm -hmm. or you know the objective responsibility. 
mm -hmm. uh, would probably be the best. Okay. But what if we have overarching questions about the entire document? <laughs> yeah, I wasn't actually talking about. I think that's good. We, yeah, we can go. We will. We can go down. But okay. um, uh, when people ask, but what I was saying is, how do you want to do it? Do you want to start here and go around the room, or do you want to start by alphabetical order, or do you have a do you have a choice? Do you have a desire? If no. not, then according to Robert's rules, it's just who wants to speak first, and then everyone gets a chance to speak. If okay, if, to. then that's fine. That's what we've done yeah. in the past. So, would anybody like to go first? Uh, I would like to just say a housekeeping thing. Throughout this, we use the word patron, and don't we now use the word member? I think we all like patron better, but are we consistent? Well, this is the hard thing because we haven't completely done the rebranding of changing um, from member to patron. And so because we were just updating the policy and it already had member in there, um, <laughs> we did keep that that verbiage. But probably at some point we do need to define, OK, now everything going forward mm -hmm. we used. But we haven't done some of that with some of our internal documents mm -hmm. yet. Um, but I'm certainly I mean, we'd be happy to do that if that's what the board would like. But um, we haven't fully made that change yet. Well, I think what you've decided is, have we as a board determined what flavor we want to be? Are we a patron or are we a member? Well, and I think what when we did last discuss it, you know, that was a little bit more of kind of a, a marketing operational mm -hmm. thing so that we kind of had a discussion and right. then um, needed to kind of work with um, kind of our, our marketing experts and so forth. So yeah. more of a, is that more of a staff decision anyway? It's more of a procedure. This is, it's not really ours. I thought we as a board had to agree. To, I thought we as a board had to agree to that change concept. I'm okay with whatever. Just is we've highlighted enough for you to be aware that at some point, once we determine what we're going to be, the wording we want to match it. We never, um, it was always a staff decision to change it. It was never a board decision. Oh, recommended to, okay. And so, um, so whatever. Mm -hmm. um, That's fine. That was just an overall thing. <clears throat> Since I had the floor, I'll say I like it. Uh, and I don't have any changes to it. Well, since I have questions about the document as a whole, I just thought I would jump in. Um, because, so I would like to know a little more about the history of the original policy and how it came to be. Um, I'm interested in knowing what research and review was done in making the changes that are proposed here. And then I'm also interested in knowing, I wrote down these three questions if, if they need repeated, if if our material selection policy is, is um, in accord with the standards set by the Board of Library and Commissioners, um, I just want to note again that under Idaho Code Section 33, 2702, subsection 6, the mm -hmm. definition of public library service for public library districts, we are to provide planned collections of materials and information services. Um, this is a state version, Idaho Commission for Libraries? No, right now I'm reading from the the definition of public library service for public library districts, which we are to provide yes. planned collections. Um, and the services shall be governed by the citizen board. And it also says here that the services shall meet standards established by the board of library commissioners. So yes. I'm just interested in knowing some of the policies that this policy incorporates. Is that so that mm -hmm. this district is in accord with the overarching standards for libraries in Idaho as established by the Idaho Board of Library Commissioners. I know, and maybe I should have put my questions to you in an email ahead of this <laughs> meeting because I, I recognize that this is kind of a huge ask. So I'm not necessarily like, and I also recognize that you've not been present for the entire <laughs> history of this policy. So, you know, I'm not expecting you to have an encyclopedia of, of knowledge, Amy, but just kind of in general terms. 
Yes. So, um, so a couple of things. I can't speak to when the original um, material selection policy for this district. I do know there's been several versions, um, and the last few times, and um, there is a statement in there that it would be reviewed every three years. So it is one that has mm -hmm. come forward to this board a number of times. Um, so typically every every three years. Um, I will say um, generally this is a core policy document that. Um, most public libraries in the U.S. have some sort of collect, either it's called material selection or collection development or, or something of that nature. Um, but yeah, I mean, we could look back as to when the very you know, first one. I, I don't know. I mean, I have several policy um, versions, but um, I don't know how far back we'd go, so I'd have to look at that. Well, and that's kind of where my question is going to, which is, um, I, I guess I'm hesitant or I just want to know before making changes as to, you know, obviously the reason for the changes and, um, you know, the, the policy as it has evolved, I guess, over the years. I'm not saying you can't change it, right. but I'm saying that we have to be mindful of, in general, the standards that, that just across the board apply, not just to this library, but all libraries. Exactly. And so so when we looked at it, um, knowing that this is a core document that stood um, some of the changes. So I you asked about kind of research that was done. I think I looked at about 30 to 40 <laughs> different um, library policies, you know, across the country um, material selection. And I did focus um, on Idaho libraries, you know, to start with. And then if there were pieces that I felt like um, you know, those policies didn't spell out something that I was looking for. And then that's where I was looking at a variety of other policies. Um, so this wording here in the responsibility section that I did look at several Idaho libraries for that. Mm -hmm. And and that wording was different. I mean, the wording we had in our original or our previous policy was a little unique. And so that's where I did um, feel like that needed to, to change. And, and there's probably some other things we could um, tweak in there. But, but I think it was important because when it talks about that the Board of Trustees is responsible for the selection of materials, that's very different from what Idaho Code says and different than our practice. And I think we need to be clear that the Board of Trustees is involved, but it's through this policy is how they're guiding the selection of materials. And I felt like that needed to be designated a little more than was spelled out in our prior policy. So that was more my um, change for there. Um, it keeps some of the same language in that we, um, the director then goes ahead and designates, delegates to um, library professionals who are qualified. Um, so we use some of that same wording, um, but because we were rewording the prior two statements, it does look like we're kind of a whole new paragraph, but some of the same wording is, is there. And then um, in terms of looking at um, the Idaho Commission for Libraries, they don't necessarily have, they have resources for developing a collection development policy. So that's where their standards are. They, they kind of point to here are all of the things you should consider when developing. So I definitely did look at that. They have their own um, collection development policy, but it really guides mm -hmm. their own materials because the um, Idaho Commission for Libraries does provide an e-resource collection. And so their material selection policy was about their e-resource collection blind. and their collection is yeah it's for the blind but then also they have a k through 12 mm -hmm. um ebook collection and so that but they don't have like a more traditional popular reading materials and, and so that's where their policy was a little bit different but we certainly look i mean i certainly looked at at their wording there and then also looked at their resources and standards that they had um, on their website and before you do that then Judy, Judy, we need Sorry. to go one by one. Thanks. I can't remember my question that way. <laughs> Could you write it down? <laughs> um, okay. Is that good, Regina? All right. Does anybody else want to move forward? Anything? Not Judy's here, here at it. It was just to follow up on this discussion, Regina, because as I think I heard you describe statutes that you were reading. That was an Idaho statute. Because we don't have another level, which is an actual version of libraries, right? Does, it, does anybody else work on these ideas? 
So they, um, so different than, um, so it's different at the national level. So at the state level, the Idaho Code um, does have, it spells out the roles and responsibilities of the Idaho Commission for Libraries and for public library districts. Nationally, there's nothing in the U.S. Code about how li public library districts are set up, though there is in the, um, you know, there are various um, rights spelled out in, in the First Amendment and others that do, that many court cases have used um, to show what the mission uh, of public libraries are. But no, there wouldn't be nothing in the US code that says here's the standards mm -hmm. for a library district. So the only thing we want to be sure of, as Regina highlighted, is that we're following what the state law says for us, to, uh, and what our ability is, and what we can do. Right. And, and then, I mean, there would be um, both. Um, you know, national organizations that also might have resources, so um, ALA and others that would have resources for how to develop these policies mm -hmm. and might have some best practices, but there would be nothing similar to the Idaho Code. Thank you. I just want to distinguish that. Thank you. Anybody else? Anybody else have anything they want to say? And then, oh, yes, I do. Oh, okay. Uh, so on the First page, the last paragraph there, the district subscribes to the freedom to read statement and the Library Bill of Rights adopted by the American Library Association. These documents are an integral part of this policy and are attached. Um, don't like being tied to the ALA. It's getting a really bad reputation. Their, their freedom to read statement and the Library Bill of Rights fails to distinguish between children and adults. Um, okay, so the freedom of read to statement mm -hmm. in the second paragraph says most attempts at suppression rest on a denial of criminal fundamental premises of democracy uh, that the ordinary individual by exercising critical judgment will select the good and reject the bad. Mm -hmm. uh, children do not have, uh, they're, they're not developmentally capable of critical judgment. Um, and I, I that it's criminal to not distinguish between children and adults. So I, I don't think I'm sorry. Sorry. What is that from again? Which one? The mm -hmm. Freedom to read statement. So the second paragraph. It says the, uh, the, the second paragraph within the first sentence that the ordinary individual by exercising critical judgment. Children are not capable of the same kind of critical judgment that adults are. They just development and they cannot. You know, they're, they're developing it, but. Oh, um, I want to just go back and say really quickly, does anybody else have anything they want to say on the responsibility section before we move to it, before we move to the intellectual freedom? Oh, I didn't realize we were now going section by section. No, and and when, when Regina said that she had some overall things she mm -hmm. wanted to say, I didn't want to limit like that, but it is a good idea to go okay. section by section, and it just seemed like a, a, a wise idea. I, I wasn't trying to not agree with you. I was trying to accommodate absolutely everyone. <laughs> I don't have anything else to say on the responsibility. I understand the, uh, the word changes actually do make more sense because we are not the ones selecting the books. Mm -hmm. We're making the policy, hopefully, to yeah. make some really good choices on the book selections, but we don't actually select them. So this does say that it's um, the library director and people under her. So I'm fine with that. Anybody else have anything they want to say? OK, I just wanted to say, um, all staff members in the general public are encouraged to recommend materials for consideration and i know that and i and that is true i mean that is something we're already doing mm -hmm. and it's something we have been doing and the selections are evaluated by the staff and i think that that's important and important i'm glad you i'm glad you put that in since it is what we're doing okay if there's nothing else on this first section then then um moving on to the intellectual freedom so we just heard um, what Rochelle had to say mm -hmm. on that. Um, uh, anybody else want to come in? Yeah, I completely agree with what Rochelle said. It's almost like the freedom to read statement, that section anyway, was definitely written in terms of either 
adult or not thinking that anything bad was going to be put in children's books. So I don't, uh, I don't, I don't know if there can be different. It doesn't have to be different policies, but if it's specified that, or at least understood that children, there are things coming at them that weren't originally thought of. Mm -hmm. um, that's all I can think of right this second because I kind of lost my thought. I know that feeling. <laughs> anybody, anybody else want to say anything to that? Um, just a couple of things um, in terms of um, both the Bill of Rights and the Freedom Tree. They they were written quite a long time ago. So the, um, the Bill of Rights was in 1939, and then um, the Freedom to Read was in 1953. So in terms of you know distancing ourselves, I, I do just want to say these documents have been around for quite some time. And, and you're right, they may not take into account. I mean, this doesn't spell out necessarily minors in here, but I'm not sure then you know, I just, I guess I would caution us that I would still want us to find some um, value in these documents because I do think that they, um, part of the reason they were written were based on some um, things that were taking place in the 1930s and the 1950s were um, efforts to, to suppress different books and ideas. Um, probably at the time was more kind of geared towards adults. And so um, I think these have become really core documents and, and I understand, you know, having some concerns about recent developments with ALA, but in terms of throwing out some core documents that have guided libraries for a long time, I, I think there is still value in these statements. Well, this is why I raised the question from the outset regarding um, what governing documents we have available to us. Mm -hmm. And as I mentioned, in previous board meetings, um, the Idaho Commission for Libraries has on its website a litany of policies that that that, that have been adopted, including um, ALA's definition of intellectual freedom, the Library Bill of Rights, the Freedom to Read statement. I mean, these are policies that are already in place and applicable to this library whether this board likes that or not. That, that's my view of it. Um, if people are interested in the um, looking at this website for the Idaho Commission for Libraries, it's libraries.idaho.gov forward slash trustees dash directors, because that's where you go to find governing documents that uh, trustees and directors uh, would need to be able to, to do our jobs and not, I mean, we don't administer the library. You administer the library. But as far as policy setting, these are the guiding documents that that we are to use um, for for policy setting purposes. And it's not a matter of opinion. Thank you, Regina. Um, anything else anybody wants to say? Um, I, I would like to say that um, some of the unhappiness with ALA recently has been in particular about the president-elect coming in and um, announcing that, you know, her, her political and personal mm -hmm. orientations. Um, but throwing out four documents from the library, you know, is like throwing out the declaration and the constitution because we're unhappy that uh, our president said he's a Catholic. Um, I think it's really important to remember that the American Library Association itself has not come out and claimed to have any, be anything other than it has made no claims of changing what it's about or where its allegiances lie at all. And, um, so the, um, the the American Library Association has been in existence since what, 1876 or something like that, something mm -hmm. 1879, something, you know, and it is the biggest and it is the largest um, library associate, public library association in the world. And I think that many people have looked at this. Now we can take, um, 
some of the concerns we have, the profound concerns that we have concerning children's things and tailor our library to them. But to take out these core beliefs that, you know, that actually apply to children as well um, would be for me like throwing out the Declaration and the Constitution and of our country. And so we, I think we need to be very careful when we, and we, and we have no ability to um, change these. This is not our stuff, um, but to, to not follow the direction of uh, the Freedom to Read Statement or the Library Bill of Rights is going completely rogue as a public library and then becomes, is it a public library in this country anymore? So um, that, that is all I have to add on that. Uh, um, I was just okay. sitting here looking, because I was looking for something specific. Mm -hmm. The second page, the back of the first page. On which document? The freedom to read statement. And it's the second um, paragraph under number two, about halfway through. It says the people should have the freedom to read and consider a broader range of ideas than those that may be held by any single librarian or publisher or government or church, which to me kind of answers that issue. If somebody is unhappy with one or two particular people at the ALA, this states right here that shouldn't be our guiding principle. The idea is not what any one person says it's what's good for everybody. Okay, yeah, there there were some good things in there that you're right about throwing out the baby with bath water. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, perhaps we could amend that to include something about protections for children or that children are capable of the same kind of critical reasoning that adults aren't. We can certainly say that in our library stuff, but we're not free to amend the freedom the freedom to read right. statement. That's not ours, understand. but we can certainly address that as we look at our policy. As we're, as we're going along section by section, there, the, um, there already is included in this proposed draft a section that is kind of calling out minors. So I'm just wondering if it might be better addressed in the, the section that we're going to, or do you... You want to talk about it? I mean, we don't have to go section by section. Well, I guess that's what I'm trying to understand. Yeah. Are, Rochelle, are you wanting something specifically in the intellectual freedom section, knowing that later in the document it is going to turn over to, you know, addressing minors? Uh, good question. Uh, yeah, I think that we should just include, and, and I'll try to come up with something as short as possible just to, to throw in there, make that differentiation. But I think that it, it does belong in the intellectual freedom section as well. <laughs> oh, I was going to say, I, I do think there should be something in the intellectual freedom um, section, uh, if you, especially if you can come up with something uh, short and mm -hmm. uh, to the point. And one of the points I was going to make earlier that escaped me was the fact that there are um, laws already uh, protecting children from adults, whether it's their parents or their neighbor, or their uncle, whatever. Um, and those are there because some adults think it's OK mm -hmm. to do whatever to a child. And I just I kind of want to tie that to um, the paragraph that Rochelle pointed out. There are a lot of adults. Um, that would like anything goes. They would like to have children to be exposed to absolutely anything. So it seems more normal. And that's why the government steps in and makes these laws in the first place, if that makes sense. And the only thing I was just going to point out is that the first paragraph under intellectual freedom, we do talk about, you know, responsibility for the use of the library for minors does rest with their parents. And I think that's um, 
I mean, so if there was something there also, but just saying there is a portion in the intellectual freedom section that does talk about minors needing um, the permission of their parents to either get a library card, you know, to, to use of the library and so forth. Anybody else? I'm sorry, I, I don't want to keep hammering the point, but there is a difference between intellectual freedom and intellectual freedom for minors, and and that is um, brought out on the on the website I mentioned earlier. Um, so I, I guess I don't have a problem as a whole with this section on intellectual freedom because it is it's just in, it's indicative of that is a core value of libraries, right? But intellectual freedom does not mean the same thing for an adult as it does for a minor. I mean, and, and this policy is not saying that it does. That, I guess that's the, the last point I want to make on, on the issue. And I'll just say adding a little sentence I don't think would be harmful to make it more clear. Is it really different? Intellectual freedom for minors is different in how, it, like how? Because it, it can be, it, can, it rests with their parents. Well, it's very confusing because if you if you follow the links on the the Idaho Library Commission's website, because there there is intellectual freedom, and then there's intellectual freedom for minors. And when you go to the intellectual freedom for minors page, you know you think it would be this nice kind of summation of a policy, but then you have to click through, and then you get to the schools and minors' rights. And so that's all I'm saying is that even the ALA, there's there's a there's a there's a distinction there. So, um, and I know what you're talking about. <laughs> okay, all righty. Um, anything else on this one, intellectual freedom, or shall we move on to review process? Okay. Um, onward. My only thing is, is let's not have the title. <laughs> down, not above this. <laughs> I, mean, I, I understand it will be changed. All right, review yeah. process. I think this might be a picky packy sort of thing, but you know, that's what I'm known for. <laughs> I think. I think the, the header the header review process is confusing because when I when you look at it not knowing anything else then you immediately think that it's applicable to um, a patron that wants to go through the review process so um, but which that's actually you know a reconsideration um, so I guess I would I would have a suggestion of maybe we could combine review process and selection criteria and come up, you know, and, and call it something else like um, selection process, selection process, right? And then we have an introductory paragraph about our selection process. And then we go into our selection criteria because those those two really go together. And so and just that that terminology review process, yes, criteria. it doesn't. Yeah, it doesn't necessarily make sense because it's 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 what the library is doing internally. And I think that makes a lot of sense. I was just leaving the headings that were already there, but I would say it really is describing the selection process, not the review process. So. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? All right, so we're now on the selection process <laughs> of anything that, anything that we would like to Say about that. It's interesting that the selection criteria looked good. What we were doing, how we were doing it before, looked good. Um, so, anything else people would like to say on the review process or the selection process? I got this. <laughs> <laughs> Essentially, that's what the staff gave you for the criteria. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, I guess I I would suggest that 
We don't even have a header, right? The section is called selection process. We have our intro paragraph, and then we have the next paragraph that says the community library network, you know, uses several criteria. And then we have, then we have these bullet points, and then we have the state, the paragraph mm -hmm. at the end that I think is really um, what I mentioned earlier, which is the the protecting minors comes, you know, comes into and plays a role in the selection process. So I like that. Um, you know, it's it's interesting. Mm -hmm. I, I certainly don't have any sort of issue that saying forms of an expression that are unprotected, you know, won't knowingly be included in the collection. Um, I just it may need to sit with this a bit longer to see, um, because I, I think some of the the members of the public that have been coming in and reading excerpts to the board of certain materials that I think all of us would, you know, not be comfortable with an 11 or 12 year old reading. And I, while I don't think that there is any sort of agenda by this library, I think possibly where you could once trust a particular publisher um, to rate books appropriately that, you know, times have changed and what would one publishing company may have found offensive 10 years ago, that same publishing company doesn't find offensive now. I mean, so I, I don't know how we address that. I'm just, I'm just um, pulling out the fact that um, I, I want, I guess, let me put it this way. Assurance to anyone that picks up and reads our selection policy that, that there has been that process and that thought that it's been looked at. You know what I mean? We're not just blindly accepting mm -hmm. the rating given by publishers, right? Because those yeah. those publishers may or may not reflect this community and um and and, and a, an appropriate age rating. Um, I didn't prepare that remark and those remarks in advance, so this <laughs> is just very off the cuff remarks. Well, and it would be tough to know how to, to represent that in here because I think that is one thing. Um, we've been having a conversation internally with our collection department because mm -hmm. we do, I mean, just kind of as a matter of course and practicality, I mean, we're purchasing thousands and thousands of books each year. Mm -hmm. I mean, there is no library in the country, no matter how small, that is reading, you know, that their selection person is reading every book before they select it for the collection. So we are reliant on things that we say above here. We're reliant on reviews, reputation of the publisher, their recommended age ranges. Right, so these are all things that we have to rely on because we're not able, there's just no way we have the staff time um, or resources. But we have been having that internal conversation that maybe we dig deeper with recommended ages. So particularly borderline stuff, right? That, so if it says that it's 10 to 14, do we start looking at erring on the side of the older age range, meaning put it in the young adult versus on the younger side? And same with, is it 16 to 20? And it might have some more explicit content, well, maybe we, that airs on the side of being in the adult collection. You know, so, so we have, we're having those conversations internally, um, retroactively doing that. I mean, that's part of where the reconsideration process comes in is, you know, I mean, there might be books that we have classified incorrectly and upon further review, that might be a decision that gets made through the reconsideration process. So I guess what I'm saying is I don't know exactly how we put it in here, but there are a variety of criteria, and we are also understanding that we might need to dig deeper sometimes with some of these resources to, to make sure that we are classifying it um, appropriately for our community, but also still, you know, it, I mean, we need to use a lot of things, a lot of factors there because it, it needs to be, um, not necessarily topic based, right? You know, because there's a difference, and and I know with some of our concerns, that difference isn't always delineated. There's a difference between something being about an LGBTQ character versus something being that has a lot of explicit sex in it. You know, th those are different, and yeah, sometimes the word obscene and pornography is being used for both. And we need, and you know, right? So we we need to be very careful about that. You know, both in our criteria that we are being very objective. And it's not um, topic based or um, viewpoint, right? You know, and so, um, so, so we were. This is this, some of these statements. We're trying to be like, you know, we we do understand, you know, that there are concerns, but we also understand. And we understand that um, there are codes that guide us too. And so we wanted to include statements, but also if there's different wording that could be added. Um, 
That was yeah. 40 minutes. I can't believe that. <laughs> 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 you want me to set it for Yeah, you can do it. <laughs> Let's set it for 10 more minutes okay. and see where we go because I think we're. Not, because this is discussion where nobody had any illusions that we would be finishing this today. Right. Um, that's why it's not action item decided. So, um, it, uh, I absolutely love the fact that the uh, Idaho codes are added. Uh, I mean, and actually sticking to them is like you were saying, it's very difficult, I'm sure, when so many books come in. Um, and it's also interesting that it's 18 and under, because I know that that can be a sticking point where somebody like, you know, a 17 year old, you know, like mm -hmm. a lot of people would feel like they, you know, are mature enough to read some of this mm -hmm. um, stuff. But um, I think the codes are perfect in there. Trying to stick to it would be the key. And I do understand that um, this is only books that the uh, the network purchases themselves any book if like Spokane or whatever has it or Coeur d'Alene has it it can still come through our library correct um yes but it would only come through by an individual putting it on hold right right okay is there anything else okay uh yeah I was uh, pleasantly shocked that this was suggested to be put in there um so just to be clear uh What's the age definitions of juvenile and young adult? Um, so juvenile is um, five to eleven. Yeah. Five to eleven. So it's school age. I mean, it would be at like elementary school age, essentially. And then um, young adult is middle school and high school. So that's been um, eleven and up or twelve and up, depending on. Uh, I mean, some things just rate it as it's a middle. You know the age range is middle schoolers others say 11 to 14 but we so 11 to 18 and 5 to 11. okay so there's no protections for um section for children under five so it says this will be excluded from the juvenile and young adult collections okay sorry and, and so this is where juvenile um we apply broadly, but we also have an actual juvenile section. So our actual juvenile section is 5 to 11, but we have easy readers, which are still considered children's materials. So yes, under five would still be included. So now we're just, sorry, we use the term juvenile in a couple of different ways. And it also says material for minors under the age of 18. So that kind of, that's kind of a blanket statement yeah. for all people under 18. Um, I did also want to point out in the statutes that um it's like okay I, I don't know if it matters what number this is but it says i know i know <laughs> um incident sexual acts normal or perverted actual or stimulated and then somewhere else in here i don't think i marked it um but my point being it's it's any sexual talk or pictures or acts it's not just lgbtq that people are concerned about, you know, because sometimes it gets um, distorted that people are against LGBTQ sex acts in books, but it's across the board sex acts in books for children. That's just a point I wanted to make. Um, anybody, anybody else? Anything? Any? Oh, yeah. Okay. And then, no, yeah, yeah, I was just, I was just going looking at the second round. Okay, ready. Okay. Uh, well, then, uh, actually, I did have one. I believe that federal law. Um, we need to keep up with federal law that also says something about no sexually explicit materials for children. So I think that, uh, that should probably be added in there as well. Good one. What? No, which section? Uh, oh, I'm still in the last section. So, anyway, just an idea. Oh, actually, I did have a couple more questions. Um, so, uh, is that is it still where we're at in this selection? Uh, yes. Okay. Good. Still on on the red bear ground. I'm sorry, Rachel. Before you move on, what was the phrase that you used? Sexually explicit materials. Thanks. 
Uh, uh, just thinking about adding something in there to mm -hmm. the list to keep mm -hmm. up with uh, mm -hmm. federal law as well, just so that we're not open to lawsuits because of that um, or criminal procedures. Um, OK, so uh, what was the official purpose for adding this into this materials policy, but not having it in previous ones? It was not here. OK. I cannot answer. <clears throat> Jimmy, why why they added it just now? Yes. Well, I can't answer for anybody, but my guess would be because of all the outcry going on right now and the issues being brought up in libraries. You know, I would think before, like I was saying, just like in this, uh, the uh, the right to read paperwork, where things weren't even thought of. You know. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I don't know. I could be way wrong. Um, I think I would say that that's true. Um, you know, the public is having a, a, tr a huge outcry mm -hmm. in what is being published and what is being put in libraries, et cetera. And it's forcing a, a situation which may have gotten slightly too liberal for, for our public to look at it and maybe perhaps pull back. And so I would think that um, looking at our policy and getting making it very clear where we want that to go is one of the ways that that happens. I was looking at the New York Times book review mm -hmm. young adult bestseller list mm -hmm. and it is far less controversial than it was even a few months ago. Um, it's interesting to me that so it could be that the outcry is also because, you know, what is what is being published? I think it's good for us to bring, you know, is is also an issue for public libraries. What is being published and therefore what is being requested? Um, so it this could be um, things had gotten a little too one way and people are pulling it a little too other. I do know that we never had we have never in the history of this library have had the kind of concern over what our collection has in it that we have had. So looking at our materials policy and tightening it up is is an excellent plan. Um, and it will never hurt us even if we go back into um, a calmer time. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure I would come as I think about this, it isn't just uh, literature, it's films what's on the social media. It's a, a whole new world of access to information that just wasn't possible mm -hmm. 10 years ago. But I'll, I mean, that reflects what our library, not only just the books we have, but the videos. Uh, what people don't like a library, they go and get on their feet on the computer and go all kinds of directions. But we don't have to have that be part of our purchasing choices. Okay, does anybody else have anything they want to add? Then why don't we, okay, I'm sorry. Yes, let me take a breath, um, <laughs> inhale. Uh, <laughs> then why don't we stop here for this discussion and we'll move this discussion to next month. So we're stopping at the withdrawal of material section? Yeah, to but you can certainly go back. Right. You know, I mean, there because, we, you know, people- <laughs> like, yeah. Reconsideration of material, okay, those two of them. Right. And so just give me a minute to pull my act together here because I am on. I have something I want to say about this next thing, which is just a continuing. So before we, as we close this up, what the materials I need to put with this are the freedom to read document and the Library Bill of Rights. To me, those go with this type of stuff. Yeah, yeah thank you. Helping pull it together. <laughs> uh oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, don't laugh. This is not funny. It's empathetic. <laughs> empathetic. All right. Trustee continuing education. Hang on a minute. Okay. Um, I was, it even says in a minute, but I was to call Jim McNall. Um, 
and ask him what he would have available. He's our iCurrent agents. He's our, our big insurance agent, and they do a lot of continuing education for uh, elected officials, in particular because they want to not pay so much money. <laughs> they want so they try to teach us how to act appropriately, which is why the college pays five hundred thousand dollars, and they won't insure us anymore. Yeah, he was yeah. just pointing that out to us uh, once again. Once again. So in talking to him, it turned out that he was going to be up here last in Post Falls last Friday. <laughs> so he said, how about if we sit down and kind of chat about it? He's a real laid back kind of easy going guy. And I said, that would be great. And I asked Amy if she would attend. Um, so the, the two of us and Jim sat down and talked and he did. Um, he had, you know, he talked about the issues concerning um, the library board and uh, I was in particular wanting to know about things about uh, public comment, how to use the gavel, um, different kinds of things like that, wanting to make sure that we were um, doing open meeting law, et cetera, correctly. Um, but he and he does offer a public official training, and he suggested coming up and doing that for us. And he would be able to come up in November. He is going to be around here in November. and. Um, and he offered to, to do uh, that class then. And we would, when we get to special meetings, that would require us to either have a special meeting or to change our November board meeting so we can talk about it. But I think that that would be worth it. He gives lots of training. Um, but the other thing that happened during that time was um, I learned that the staff had expressed concern to Amy about. Uh, some board activities, board issues that we were involved in. And Jim, who's a pretty laid back kind of guy, all of a sudden came to attention from some of the things that I described that was happening. And he said, these activities could be costly to the library. And he, his recommendation and his very serious recommendation was that we, um, we we present these things with our board attorney. We get our board attorney to come to talk to the board and talk about the issues. And I had also wanted her um, wanted to know more about the First Amendment concerning our library, our our obligations to the First Amendment. Mm -hmm. um, and so to that end, and because he was quite concerned, um, I asked Amy to contact Katie Brereton, and she may be able to come and and talk to us in October, and these issues are of concern enough that they would be in executive session. So we would be having our attorney give a presentation in, uh, in executive session on, in October, if she's able to. I don't know. Uh, Amy, you, October. November is Jim. Okay. I am, the, yeah, right. Well, it isn't two different meetings. We would have uh, Katie Brereton come we would have both of them come during our regular meetings if we're able to. Um, but um, his concern led to big concern, and it's like, okay, we and we need to, this. These need to be talked about. You know, we need we need as a board need to look at this. And um, he also expressed a great deal of confidence in Katie Brereton as an attorney. We had our library has used her in the past. Um, when John was our director, and um, and you know, she has chosen. He said, for whatever reason, people would choose to do this, <laughs> but to be an attorney for govern a government, mm -hmm. you know, like attorney. That. So she specializes in that. And I have never met her, uh, but I know that she's been around here for a long time. And um, so anyway, so Amy, do you have anything you'd like to add to that? No, we're just getting um, confirmation from her. Um, she was already planning to provide us um, um, some First Amendment resources. She knew we were reviewing our uh, material selection policy, so she was gathering some resource material, didn't have it in time for this. So we had already kind of penciled in possibly our October meeting. So I'm just getting confirmation as to her. OK, so um, those are, you know, our insurance agent and our attorney coming to our meetings. Um, felt like important trustee continuing education for all of us. Um, so that's all I have to say. 
And then Katie clarification, the October board meeting is, I think we slid a little to did we slide it? Uh-huh. Yeah. I think it was for was it for Regina? I don't know. It's on yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's mine. Oh, yeah. So mine was this one. <laughs> October 18th versus okay. Okay. And so that's all I have to say on that. So I feel really good because I did what I was finally supposed to do, which is not that good at all. I didn't know it was going to get bigger. <laughs> so, okay. Sorry, my comments are delayed, but it's only because I needed to look up the Idaho Code um, reasons that you can hold an executive session. So I'm assuming, and you know, you're being very opaque, but I'm assuming that it would be to hear complaints um, and it says four charges. Obviously, we're not talking about charges, but you know, potential complaints brought against a public officer, employee, staff member, individual. Um, but, and I thought there was another one to communicate with legal counsel to discuss legal ramifications and legal options um, for or controversies that are not yet litigated. Yeah, I mean, we have some, some a lot of leeway there in the executive session. But anyway, just. That is okay. correct. This, uh, Those two would hit it. Bringing it up mm -hmm. that just to confirm this would be the reason we need to have it in executive session. Yes. Is that right? Yes. Can you highlight those two? Yeah. Cool. Now, so that we can <laughs> okay, that sounds good. Thank you very much. Nice job. Well, I mean, we really, I mean, just make a note, put it on the agenda because we always read what section of the Idaho mm -hmm. code we, we are relying right. on to go in for executive yeah. session and it's almost always A, um, but this would be subsection B and F, I think. Sorry, I didn't look that up. Yeah, but but, but anyway, so that's why I'm yeah. I did know that it fit under executive session. Madam Chair, is your thought that that might occur during the 18th meeting or are you looking to yeah. do another one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. If we can get Amy Brereton. Is that right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So there's that. And then the next thing is the board calendar, which we put together. And this, I'd like to point out that it's actually on time. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> it's the first time I part of thank you, but that was, it was only because I said something because I have been just Looney Tunes with her. So stuff on our business. So Amy actually typed this out. It was really <laughs> cool. It was the first time that's ever happened for me. It was really cool. Um, Amy and I sat down and worked worked this out for the big thing so that we would have a direction for next year. Mm -hmm. um, I I don't know, Amy, if you would like to talk about it some or. Um, um, I mean, I'll let you. I mean, we just put in some of this stuff. Um, I think originally. Um, Typically, it had strategic plan in the first few months, October through December. But we just finished the strategic plan, so we don't. But hopefully soon, we would have the implementation plan that um, staff work on with library strategies, and we'd be able to bring that for just presentation, basically. So we can earmark that in November and December. Uh, our hope is to start the facilities master plan sometime in early 2023. So you'll see those items there. Mm -hmm. And then we just plugged in. It is an election year um, for library trustees next year. So we've earmarked that. And then if we do have any new trustees that we would have different points for new trustee orientation. Um, Where's that date in May? You do it. Yeah, so if you if you look under May, oh, yeah. you'll see at the very bottom, May 17th is the trustee yeah. election. And then over the next few months, we've just kind of um, okay. put in new trustee mm -hmm. orientation. That's also right during the budget time as well. Um, so those are lined up there also. And then Katie, I'll let you talk about it. Well, the only thing uh, that I would like to put in there is that, although it doesn't need to be in, but it will be, I kind of wanted Amy to put it in, it was it, it says strategic plan dashboards. I don't know if you remember, but they said they'd have dashboards and I am really big on dashboards. Mm -hmm. And so I'm going to push that forward so that we will be looking every month at our strategic plan and we'll develop a way to look at that. Um, that would be good, but but I don't want us to have taken all that time and money, set that direction, and not keep not have the board keep looking at it and saying, are we still heading in that direction? How is that? What are the things that are happening to take us there? So it the strategic plan dashboard kind of stopped 
then but but actually I would hope that it would continue on, you know, on a month. And I stopped because I ran out of work. Yeah, I understand. <laughs> <laughs> but but you get it, right? <laughs> but that sets the scene then for budgeting that follows it. Yeah. Which is if we've aren't happy with what we're doing or want to change it, all this is is a plan for us to modify as we go along. That to me is the basis from which we do our budgeting. So, is there? Job. Thank you. Right, and then we put in at the top. We didn't put dates because you know, like we always stay the right home. <laughs> but um, we put in at the very top are the the reports that we will be getting from each one of the um, libraries or mm -hmm. departments. And I think that that is that's been valuable for us over the years. So if there is, you know, is there? We do have it as an action item, um, but do we have discussion on this? Or let's go ahead and uh, is the it can be changed. Question on as I read the calendar, December twenty or no, June twenty three is annual board meeting. Okay, that makes sense after the election in May. We can set up our election officers and then that's the local office. Yep, good. Thank you. Uh, Madam Chair, I move that we approve the Community Library Network Board calendar for fiscal year 2023. Okay, it's been moved to approve the Library Network Board calendar for FY23. Is there any more discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Opposed? Okay. It always gets it, but this is invaluable in working on, on planning for the year. All right, facilities updates. I don't really have anything. Um, Randy will be coming in November to kind of give us a big overview. Um, there are a number of projects that have been budgeted for this year. I've already talked about that um, we didn't get to either because we put them on hold or then a few others that we had hoped to do that the contractors just can't fit us in. <laughs> and this is after months of, of trying to work with it. So there will be a few more projects that will either you know that we'll propose for carrying forward so to speak or carrying over so um so yeah otherwise it's just kind of business as usual yeah. facilities but they did do the spirit lake parking lot and the first falls first falls wasn't a repair it was just a restrike but... and those burns that are such a <laughs> problem at hayden and well, i still don't know about that i mean i don't have a i question whether we need to spend all that money on those berms but mm -hmm. that was actually the project that was put on hold for the spirit lake parking lot <laughs> is so it, we won't is be anything is is stuff seeping in actually or does anybody know i don't think this year it's been no rain not much yeah we had a pretty decent rainy yeah. but not i don't know that it's months. been too bad this year yeah. i think there was like one in like during the rainy. Oh, so we want to spend a hundred million thousand dollars to stick out <laughs> for one incident? We did put on hold. So I'm just <laughs> I don't really want the berms to go. I know they're a pain in the neck, but I don't really want them. Well, Madam Chair, I would suggest that we use this time while we're holding to, as best you can, monitor what's happening so we get a history of how often it leaked and from whence it happened. Begin to help us focus on what do we do with it. Because there's some very there's some options we can look at. It's been there since Sunday night too. It's well, fun. and this was a project that kind of pre yes. predated me, yes. but that you know Randy and I have had lots of conversations that if this truly is is a need, we need much more. You know, we need kind of a lot of details to yes. know the why, the how, you know, and 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 explore perhaps a variety of options. So he was willing to put it on hold. I think based on that, it was something that has been an issue on and off, but we know that um, this may, you know, the whatever it was going to be, $25,000 or whatever, may not be the best use of funds and perhaps there's a more inexpensive alternative. Or so he, long -term versus so yeah, we were willing to definitely put it on hold. And, yeah. But I just and, don't want to lose that time to monitor what's happening. Yeah. Journal whatever it is that happens, whatever amount of water or where it comes from, as best you can tell, maybe we need to do some drilling to look in there and see where the water is coming from. There's some things for remediation that we can. Yeah, but we may not need to, is what I'm saying. I'm like, what's the problem? Well, do I we mean, have mildew growing in there? I don't know. I don't know. I've never heard what the problem is. I just heard that there's leakage. I've heard that there's that's, that's my point. 
I mean, there's been leakage. I don't know that it's damaged necessarily the actual, I mean, what the concern about is that it's right there with the genealogy section. So it's damaging things that we don't know. <laughs> so we want to be careful about not damaging things that particularly, I mean, we don't want to damage our yeah. items, but for sure, not someone else's items. But I don't think there has been damage of materials, but there has been carpet and, and also so forth. Yeah. And rotting wood if it's wet. Right. She on the those yeah. things. It's real. Okay. Show me. <laughs> Legislative <laughs> updates. <laughs> Legislative update. Anything anybody has? I'll do a couple uh, because the uh, election in November, but in addition to that, the budget surplus that the governor just shared around the state a bit is amazing. And that was to fund a lot of educational issues, both higher ed. And uh, I don't know where libraries came about in that funding issue. I know the governor was excited to be able to provide three billion to two to higher ed and one to K through 12. So there's lots going on there that's been allocated by the governor and the special session said, yep, that's great. But the special session occurred with legislators who may not be back, won't be back necessarily in December. The JSAC committee will be a very new configuration of folks. Uh, and there's concern about folks' approach to education. So, and then the legislature goes into effect in January. Um, so, I think it's worth us paying attention to as things shape up. And then I don't want to forget about meeting with the Fort Lane Library as we go into legislative session, because sometimes that helps. If, and I think you're going to do a video or you're going to try and catch a video with some Boise folks that are doing a program through the uh, City Club in Boise that I emailed to you and Katie. Uh, and that may give you some more insight as to what's happening in Boise because it's oftentimes not necessarily reported here as well. So I, I just would highlight to you that there will be a lot of food fights over the education money that's now being made available because we've had a surplus like we've never had before in the state of Idaho. I'll probably put there enough by now, for now, but uh, it may be that we, as a larger board, will need to advocate for some things when we get closer to it. Okay, can I ask a follow up question about what is the, did you say a club or something that's happening? Yeah, the City Club in Boise. I had to be on their mailing list, and this is a Zoom one that I sent to you. Uh, it's occurring in September, so I couldn't do it. But they are gathering with the Boise Library folk. I mean, at the Ada Community Library. Okay. So, I mean, it's a Boise. Okay. Talking about library issues, uh, just as an education gathering. But what I find is sometimes what's going on in Boise is not necessarily from all the way north. So, part of that networking is see what you hear in Boise. And then maybe we still need to look at joining with the Portland Library for uh, issues that we may want to be coordinated on, just because it's more effective that way. One of the difficulties of joining with them, that'd be fine. I mean, that's a great idea, but once again, we need specifics for an agenda. And that is, I mean, that, and if, if we had some specifics that we really wanted to meet with them over, we could put those in writing and ask them if they would want to meet okay. concerning those yeah. specifics. But I don't know what that would be. I suspect that the food side over education dollars will become that for the uh, Commission for Libraries where money was removed. Whether or not that's going to continue, it's hard to tell until the legislature gathers. But that's kind of a December, January look at what's happening and where we need to lobby or not. For and laws. We're going to put librarians in jail if I want to understand why. Okay. Anything else? All right. On discussion of future agenda requests, um, there, this is the board self-evaluation. That was a request from Judy. At this point in time, maybe we're having a two-pronged approach with Jim McNaughton coming and then our attorney coming, and then we can re-look at that. Does that sound acceptable, Judy? Oh, you betcha. This, okay. this is doing what I want to be sure you. Sounds like you heard from Jim No, We need to understand what our board role and responsibilities yeah. are, mm -hmm. uh, particularly as the legislature is both in a second. It's not that easy to get his attention, and we got him. Bravo. <laughs> 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 um, 
So, all right, then down to um, set special mm -hmm. and regular meeting um, date. Actually, you said sorry, mm -hmm. the thing that I brought up at the beginning. Oh, okay. So oh, that's right. I'm sorry. Yeah, so no, I actually had two two things. One in line with the allegations, and I can't remember. I always get them confused. Bonners Ferry or Boundary County, mm -hmm. um, with uh, uh, some alleged alleged sexual misconduct, um, among other things. Uh, I was to take steps to avoid going down a similar path and just make sure that we're protected here. Could you elaborate? I'm sorry, I don't know what we're talking about. Um, there was alleged elections fraud and alleged librarian pole dancing naked and sending her to work herself to a 13 year old child and the yeah. parents got a hold of it. And that has been turned over to the police. Like I said, alleged. I haven't. Yeah. I don't know. Um, I just, pole dancing librarian. I love it. Naked pole dancing librarian. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Are you the 13 year old? <laughs> no, so, just like that. Just all of the librarians I've ever known in my life. I cannot visual, visualize that one of them naked pole dancing. Okay, I'm going to try not to. <laughs> <but. laughs> I just cannot. Anyway, all right. But there was a resignation of the library director in Bob's account. So you're asking whether this should be on the agenda. Is that what you're saying? That um, that I guess so. I mean, I just I don't know what steps you would need. You're concerned that our director's pole dancing making? No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. No, but I, I wasn't putting that out there. She did it. <laughs> okay, Katie, can I say something? Maybe. Fine. <laughs> um, so, so yeah, there's a variety of things going on with Boundary County. They have a tort lawsuit and some other things against them. I will say, I mean, they're against the trustees, against some library staff. I mean, there was no, several people mentioned in that. I will say they're they're a much smaller system than us. We've had a sexual harassment and other. Um, code of conduct policies in place that I'm guessing perhaps they did not. So we do have some very strong personnel policies in place and we don't have library staff having social gatherings and we, but I would just say, I mean, there's other things the board can certainly discuss, but in terms of that, we do have some very strong personnel policies in place that perhaps some, a smaller library system would not have had in place. Um, and then, but, in the next few months, I was hoping we would look at our personnel policy mm -hmm. manual anyway, so we can certainly look at that. So I'm just offering if there's, I mean, if there's anything this board wants to discuss, fine, but the personnel policy may be an area that there was already a couple of outdated things that admin team wanted to address in the personnel policy, True. but if there was some other things. How have I not heard of this? I'm sorry. Yeah, I just like, oh, what's going to do? <laughs> and is the, the, I know there's a lot the of trouble with the, the trouble that the librarian is in is that connected to the trouble that the the board is in well um so i will say the library director was not the one um, allegedly pole dancing that was a library staff member with mm -hmm. other stuff in fact that happened a couple of years ago prior to the library oh. director that just resigned oh. even coming on board but so there's a whole variety of things um, in the tort claim against the but it is election um fraud and it is um transparency. I mean, it's it's this um, misconduct of employees. I mean, so there's a whole variety of things that were named in this in this tort mm -hmm. lawsuit. I mean, in terms of election fraud, this library system has always been very open about posting of and will continue to do so in terms of posting when elections are. Wasn't there also with the Port of Lane library system no misconduct, but libraries are feeling Staff are feeling under siege, and so the library in Port Lane had a staff on their leave. Spokane had a staff on their leave. The Valley's leave. So there's just a lot of turmoil, and so I think it's wise for us to be sure we have in place what we want to be our staff, our director to have, and our director to manage amongst our employees. Do we? Do you feel as director that we have any vulnerable spots in the same way that? Um, the library in Bonner's Ferry does. No, um, partially because uh, I mean, there's a variety of things that have happened there over the years that have not happened here. 
Um, so one was um, alleged of not posting um, board elections. There was allegedly that the former, former director two or three times ago would recruit board members um, and then, then not publicize. That's never happened here and will not happen here. Um, also, I mean, some of the, and, and again, I've only read the tort claim. I don't know, you know, anything else, but the staff members misconduct, that's not anything that has happened here. Um, so um, the board recall was happening, but you know that was kind of also separate. That was a yeah. separate group organized. Well, there may have been some overlapping interests there, but um, I think some of that. I mean, I crimp not renewing um, mm -hmm. was because of some of these um, lawsuits oh, right. and yeah. right. And um, so, no, um, I would say what's happened there is is very different. Though I mean, they've certainly had concern over material, but it was also like I mean, they had like. Mm -hmm. A bajillion, maybe not a bajillion. There was a lot of things going on. Yeah, I'd say bajillion. <laughs> um, I would like to say, and um, those participated um, with John Hartung, one of the things about John was that he was squeaky clean about us being an ethical library board, squeaky clean. Mm -hmm. So we have, I mean, he was just adamant about law um, and he acted appropriately and we didn't do inappropriate things. And so, if there are concerns that this library specifically is doing something right now, then that's great. But to talk about what another library is doing, we have no control over that. Um, and if we have things in place that are, I mean, I, I, I'm kind of horrified when I read just a little bit about Bottersbury. Mm -hmm. um, I'm like, holy mackerel, I am so happy that this is not, was not the way I was brought up in my public libraries. Um, but so would heading toward looking at the personnel policy work. Okay. Yeah, and we probably want to make sure that we're not picking up people who've left other places for doing things that were not right. Don't we do? I mean, we um, have background checks, don't we? Um, we do reference check. Uh, I'm not that hard to find out. Okay, so our, uh, so personnel policy, looking at it for the future, and I can put that down under here like we did for the material selection. Um, and that will suffice for this particular issue, Rochelle? Yes. Okay. All right, and you said you had something else. Yeah. So we have in place the calendar meeting for October 18th. Go ahead with the floor. Yes, in November. So, okay. So, comment on last month's public comments. Um, Mariana showed an email from Amy Rhoda to Jeanette Laster of HREI, alerting Ms. Laster of all book challenges a month in advance of the Board of Trustees meeting. I'm wondering if that falls within the scope of your job. I'm just, just wondering if there's any liability for- Is this board. something that needs to be talked about in executive session? No? Okay. Um, no, I will say, um, we had a number of people ask about that time what books were being challenged. That's public information. I am the public information officer. Um, so she had asked. Um, we were at a, she. We were at a community event, and she said, "What are the five titles?" Because she had already heard from someone else. I do not know who. Um, that the five books have been challenged. So I emailed her the five titles. Thinking about that public comment time, because I found it one of the more uncomfortable moments in our board. Uh, and my steering wheel hurt a whole lot while I was driving up here. But now it needs to be, how do we manage public comment time so that some of the comments and language that were used last time don't happen again? I we have had a long talk about that with Jim. Thank you. And if that's something that we want to use some time of about. I don't know. It's not an agenda item. I, I'm not sure. I mean, we can, but um, uh, it's under comments. If the comment topic occurs here, like we've shown, 
Okay. Yeah, we but we're a little uncertain as to what to do with that. Um, I guess I just want to make some comments to my fellow board members about how the public comment session went last time, uh, and probably a little bit of a sanity check on the, on. The, I was uncomfortable with it. I felt it was in, inappropriate for some of the comments that were made, and I happened to attend another board meeting where. Another group was struggling, how many commissioners are, and I see board was with behavior of those who were making public comment, not staying on topic, uh, not stopping because they were asked to stop. And at the college board meeting, the president said, turn off the mic and escort this person out. The person did not go out, the security came over and stood beside him, and he finally wound down. But it was a really <laughs> difficult situation for everybody. And I want to be sure we don't escalate to that point. And I felt like last time it was further than it should have been. Uh, and some sort of wording that I know you have for public comment, what people need to remember about staying on task. No derogatory comments on people, it seems to me. It would be important to do. You know, I was going to Albertsons the other day. There's a sign on their door. You go into the Albertsons. I think I sent it to you too. I took a picture of it. It talks about safety when you're in the Albertsons, the way you're treated, both you as a customer and staff. Albertsons. Next time you go in Albertsons, take a look for it. It's a surprising corporate statement about people's behavior, which I just see as part of that escalation. So, Katie and I, you and I talked about it for how do we um, all public comment, but not have it ever be derogatory or inappropriate to the staff, to us, to people who are attending. And last time I saw a mom take her children out before the comment went along. I thought this is not bobo. So those are my concerns that I want to try and address you. If I'm the only one that has those concerns, I'll have to figure out what to do about it. But I was troubled for our, our conduct of our meeting. Katie, you talked to Katie Brereton a little bit about this, did you? I did. Um, and it's kind of um, that's a tough situation under open meeting law. We mm -hmm. don't necessarily have to allow public comment, but if we do, then we're under, um, we're then a limited public forum. So the only restrictions really are time, manner, place. And uh, so I'm talking to the agenda item. So time, manner, place. And so time, you know, we've given the three minutes. Manner, I mean, we, we've spelled out in our um, mm -hmm. policy that no personal attacks. Um, you know, speak to, we say, we don't say agenda items. We say library issues. Oh, okay. So we don't limit it to just what's on the agenda. Um, sure. so, you know, her, her advice was, you know, if somebody's meandering to their point, like if only their first couple of sentences is about the library in the last few, I mean, you could redirect them, but it would be difficult to ask them to not have their three minutes if they're just meandering. Um, she did say if somebody's talking about books we don't own, we could stop and redirect that because we, that's not our library issue, right? I mean, that would be another library issue. Um, vulgar language was one that came up. She was going to research that. She was more inclined to be like, that's hard to control and hard to... Um, monitor because we do once we've opened it up for public comment then it does become a first amendment and so we we have our policy so um katie reminds them at the beginning of what you know what our guidelines are and you can do a redirection but if you're really going to end it should be um those personal threats or somebody disrupting another person's time for public comment and um, or going well over you know going over their time and not um, doing so that was basically what Jim McNall said as well. And um, one of the things that um, that the, the chairperson has a lot of control over what happens. Um, I have a gavel. Um, I'm not a gavel user. There are very clear ways that you use a gavel in parliamentary procedure. I'm not a I'm not a gavel user. So I when I talked to Jim, I was uh, saying that to him, apologizing. And he, um, he, and I, and there, and and because of the discussion with him, I was able to be get clearer about how I feel as a chairperson, looking at and controlling public comment, based upon our um, policy. And 
One of the things he so I said I'm not really a gavel person. He said I, I said I know you told me to get a gavel. I did. I, I am not great at that. I'm not sure exactly when to use it, and it looks to me like throwing gas on a fire sometimes. Um, I um, and he paused and he said to me, "This is one of my finer moments." I, um, and he said, "It's it's." It speaks to your character that you don't use the gavel a lot, because he said I've, I've seen it used to control people and to control yeah, the comment. Yeah. And my, um, I tightened up. I was kind of like, what? I t I really tightened up my pre my pre public comment this time, or to really highlight, you know, what we would like to hear from people, and we would like people to address us, and, you know. But I will say that as far as I'm concerned, when people come and the people who've been coming are passionate about what they're doing, I am not interested in getting involved in a verbal volley Great. at all. And not only that, I am not one to be able to quickly chop people off to the ankles at the, you know, at the knees. I am not verbally. I don't do that. And so all it does, if I say something, my silence is 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 as far as I'm concerned, better for all of us in that they say what they need to say. Now I will I will stop people and redirect. Um, but if they choose not to anyway, um, I am not going to, you know, what seems easier for me is that we sit through their three minutes. And now if we have something like happened in Harrison where somebody loses it, we talked about that a little bit, and what I am going to do is I will use the gavel there. I will also ask for a break for the meeting, and I will stand up. Now, in Harrison, there was no place to go. I will stand up, and I will invite everybody else to stand up and to leave the room should we need to. Um, and then people can choose as to what they, they need to do. Um, but to, you know, however I feel about what's being said, what's being said, the people, at least we, the people we've had, a lot of people we've had recently are very, very passionate about what they believe. And we don't need to make that, to explode that. So far, it's been fairly civil, <laughs> with the exception of Harris. Um, I, uh, the one thing is we did have, um, a comment which could have been made at, taken as a personal attack, and that is when that is on a staff member, and that is when Jim McNall stood up. Is that that is that is um, that's what he says. What all he what he says is that could be costly. So those are the kinds of things that absolutely need to be stopped. Um, when I said to him that one of uh, the people that was commenting had used the word bullshit. He said, well, that's pretty mild as it goes. <laughs> so, so, you know, I mean, what do I do? Do I stop that person and say, don't use that language and then maybe get more of it back? Or do we just move on? And it isn't like I'm sitting here passively. I'm not at all. Um, but I'm cho not choosing to inflame the situation. Thank you. That makes sense to me. On the other hand, it seems to me as a public board, the role modeling we do for what a language is used to present to us and in front of our staff uh, is something I think we have the responsibility to say we don't do things that way. I'm not sure how and when that happens. And maybe so in me. I'd be interested in hearing from the other board members uh, kind of language or personal attacks on anybody. You know, sooner or later it's going to happen to us too. You know, that doesn't bother me because I have the luxury of saying it doesn't fit. But the role modeling that does for board functioning in public, how we have our staff portrayed at all levels. And hey, there had to be a bunch of staff there, so I was particularly annoyed by it. Uh, and so we need to, as a board role model, uh, special, dignified engagement with the public. Did it bother anybody else? Am I the only one? And therefore, I need to be quiet. Which part bothered? It's what are you asking? Like even the last meeting? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. There was some uncomfortable. Uh, more more last meeting than having to hear Viper read off that book. 
you know, <laughs> months ago, which I thought probably topped it all. But um, yes. uh, Katie, I think that you do a wonderful job. I think you do an amazing job. I think yep. you make the right decisions. And I think when, if and when you use a gavel, it'll be at the correct time and you'll know it when it happens and your hand will just go to it. But Hopefully. you know what I mean? I'll put it next to you. I, 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 <laughs> I, uh, I appreciate how you handle all the public comments. And I think you're right. Um, I hope, I know I have very thick skin. Hopefully everybody has thick enough skin that they can listen to whatever the person's saying for three minutes. Unless, of course, it gets outrageous and you have um, spoke up in those times before. Yeah, it does say no personal attacks. Um, or disruptions. And one of the things that I'm going to also request is that there are people who sit in the audience and, you know, pull up signs. Yeah, and, you know, I don't know the holding signs, it's so bad, but let, you know, around and stuff. And, and just asking that we do that. But if they do that, I was just going to say, Beauty, since you've asked all of us to chime in, mm -hmm. I don't think I'm a good barometer. Um, since my day job is is contentious <laughs> and <laughs> with dignity, then I think we do act with. I mean, we do. They that the public has a right to come and and talk to us about what they don't like. That the right to use or the threateningness or degrading to people. Right, that part we need to to yeah. stop. Some the the part that it was um, attacking us. It happened so quickly. Yes, that it was like, yeah, we'll just let that go, you know, rather than dwell on it, which makes it just then then we're looking at the whole situation, you know. Okay. Yeah. Actually, as one who has been personally attacked, but then came across a Supreme Court case that said that public officials should expect. I can't remember exactly, but basically vehement and angry outbursts from people that um, I should not have said anything. I should have just taken what you said. I feel like the word is derision. derision. Oh, no. I, the person that you were talking about at that meeting, I felt went over the top, asking us, somebody asking us, that's telling us they don't feel like we're fit to be for office. I think that, I don't know, you know, I mean, that's, it seems to me that's the public's right. Uh, but that that person went too far, and um, and I even talked to that person in the break, and he said, "Yeah, I know I did." Okay, <laughs> I was going to say per personal threats should never be tolerated, but um, if they're just no, they, no, I found like I off that they're angry and they think that you know we're a dirt bag, then that is their First Amendment right to say that. Okay, uh, if people are really? it is, right, if so, people are yeah. starting to call board members, board staff, dirt bags and stuff, I will be stopping them. That's a real personal attack. It says no personal attacks. Right no. in our process. Uh, right Thank in you. Well, that's what the policy says, but I don't know that that's what law says. And we need to make sure that we're not uh, yeah, the free speech that line. Is a fine line. Mm -hmm. I think no personal attacks is in a lot of public uh, comment policies. It doesn't mean it's legal. It, it's in the policy. I mean, you know, you're trying in the policy to kind of, you know, shape some standard but yeah when you get to first amendment i mean this is a little bit where jim mcnall and katie Burton mm -hmm. differed because katie was very clear that people have the right to petition the government about the government and complain yeah. about yeah. government yeah. officials yeah. yeah you know and and that could sometimes feel like a personal attack you know there's a okay i well i know specifically and i felt like that guy had crossed the line and i know i feel good about that one because that came you know, and it's like, yeah, wait a sec here. You're getting a little too personal, you know. And um, but at, just asking us, telling us that they think we're doing a terrible job, and asking us to stop is probably acceptable. No. Anyway. Okay, so um, we're good. I think if we don't have anything else, then oh, we need to look at the November meeting. Uh, Jim McDonald said he could be here. On the something like the Tuesday before the 15th, the 15th instead of the 17th for November. What would you guys think about changing our board meetings from the 17th of November to the 15th? <laughs> Let's start meeting on the 13th. Let's just be no, on I'm the just Tuesday. Yeah. We're changing the entire meeting. Yeah. Oh, taking the whole thing out. Yeah. Unless you want a special meeting. For the time, that's the question. Do we have enough time to pull yeah. down Jim and Nell and Rucker? 
Yeah, that and that may be the case. We could do that. We could ask him to give us a an education on the 15th and we meet on the 17th. Better do it once if we could. I'm okay with the 15th. I'm okay with 15th. I can't do it till after one. That's good because we beat two to five. Okay. You said you can't do it till after one. One. And I said that's okay. good because we meet two to five. This time we would also. Yeah. That seem okay, Michelle? Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. It is. There it is. And we'll see what we can do about putting it in. I would even rather have us go a little longer and have it on one day. How does that sound? That's fine. That means we take it off of the 18th. Um, so when we originally put possible special meeting in October, that was about a slightly different reason. We were saying that possibly, but we don't know this yet, in October we may be reviewing the um, compensation study results oh, as well as okay. the material selection policy. And if we don't get through some things, so we won't know until the next, you know, till October 18th, but it's possible we might need another meeting in October. Do you want to kind of look at that now and put down a possibility for that time? Because and we may not need it. It was just more we wanted to get it on people's radar. Oh, let's put it a pencil in. And if Katie Burton's coming as well, that's going to be a really jam packed. Right. What do you think about having a special meeting the following week for compensate for anything else that we might need it for? That would be not in not cast in bronze, but if we needed to have some pencil. Yeah, some pencil, yeah. <laughs> the following week of you mean after November 15th? Right. October, 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 October 2020. 23rd. 23rd. Wait, the first one is on the 18th. That stays. Yes. And we had two at the 23rd. No, we had two at some. What could you meet? Could you pencil in a time? What would a time if we needed a special meeting, what time would work? And right. Oh, Frankly, we should probably give a couple dates because yeah. I mean I would I would hate if you go to Katie Burton and you've got these two dates and she's like, well, those don't work. And then she gives you dates and typically Back and forth. Yeah. So maybe we could come up with a couple of times. What about looking at both Tuesday and Thursday since we seem to be able to do Tuesday, Thursdays? Tuesday the 18th would be the regular. Yes. And the yeah, well, I can yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. The 25th or the 27th? Well, 25th. Okay, Mr. Both. Regina? Yeah, me too. Okay. Judy, Mitchell, are you guys good for both? For the possibility of both? 25th. Yeah. It's hard. Is there, are there times in that day which would work? The 25th says no, I can't. Okay, so it's. This is serious. I came home from a trip and opened the refrigerator door. Ew. And the refrigerator is going to be ordered. It's coming on the 25th, but they never tell you what time. I've got to rebuild the refrigerator container to hold it. And so, a fair, I. Monday instead? But Monday. I could do to the 27th. Okay. So, there, I'm meeting here, say, two ish on um, Thursday, the 20th. So, yeah. any other day that week look okay for you? Monday says it's Diwali. So, I wonder what that is. It's an Indian holiday from India. Oh. No, <laughs> <laughs> okay, would how about Monday afternoon in, sure. as an as an alternative? Monday's nice. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So okay. that gives us a couple of days that week. Should we need them? So hang on to that. We'll just just put down two. Two to five on Monday the twenty fourth. I don't know that we'll need. We probably if, it, if there's special meetings, we typically go through four. Whatever budget or three to five or something. The twenty seventh, we're also penciling in. Right, this, that that'll give Amy a couple of days for a possible compensation study, possible which is rare, possible every Monday. And and probably how we prioritize the compensation study would probably be at the regular meeting date, just so that we have time to if we're implementing anything for payroll, which is that next week. Okay, okay. but then so then we might. Just reorder that, um, but then, yeah, we can talk with Katie Burton about um, a couple of different dates, or if she comes and we do compensation at the regular meeting, then it may be that then we have the actual material selection policy discussion at the special. Okay, so, so just plan on having a meeting that week. It sounds like we've got too much going on, but but not both days. No, just one. Yeah, we just don't know which. Don't one. get carried away. <laughs> yeah, right. Okay, and, and um, December we're in. I mean, December is in place. 
We're not having <laughs> anything special in December. We're not. We're, I'm no, we're just a standard meeting now. Yeah. The 15th. yeah, that sounds great. Ten days before Christmas would be good. I hate it when it's three days before this. Yes. Um, all right. Um, then at this point in time, if there's nothing else, I will. Um, one of the things I would like to say, the public comment policy wasn't quite on the agenda, but I'm very glad we have it. Um, and uh, then I would entertain a motion to adjourn. I move that we adjourn. Okay, it's been moved to adjourn. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All right, thank you very much.